Welcome to the Google Cloud Platform Networking Fundamentals course. The goal of this course is to help you as an IT professional to get enabled quickly in Google Cloud Networking Services. This course has been designed to provide an introductory overview of Google Cloud Networking features, functions, and services. We will be covering services such as a virtual private cloud. We'll be discussing peering and also what is the difference between hybrid connectivity options. We'll then proceed on and whiteboard out some of the services so that we grasp how Google Cloud can really provide enterprise grade level networking and security services to enterprises such as yours. Google Cloud has some really amazing features and I really do hope you could join the course to find out more about services such as Cloud DNS, Cloud Router. We'll also talk about pairing and shared VPCs as well. We'll also get into load balancing and go through some demos as well around HTTP load balancing and other services. We'll also get into Stackdriver and how that can be utilized to monitor your VPC flow logs as well. We'll then proceed on and start wrapping up the course by talking about Deployment Manager and other services related to networking as well. We'll then finally wrap up with some resources such as Quick Labs, Code Labs, and other resources that are free for you to use. Lastly, we'll talk about Google Cloud certifications and then close out the course with more resources for you to learn more. I'm really looking forward to working with you and I do hope to see you in the course. We have a lot to learn, so let's get started. Welcome to the Google Cloud Platform Networking Fundamentals course. The goal of this course is to help enable you understand Google Cloud Platform networking services from both a high level and a deep level perspective. Throughout the course, I'll be performing numerous demos and whiteboards as well to talk about the different aspects of Google Cloud Networking. Before we get started, let's do a quick introduction. My name is Joseph Holbrook and I've been in the IT industry for well over 25 years. I'm a prior U.S. Navy veteran and also have had the opportunity to work for numerous vendors from Hitachi Data Systems to Brocade Communications over to EMC Corp and various partners as well. I've had the opportunity to get certified in Google Cloud Platform as well as AWS and numerous other certifications. With that said, let's go ahead and get started on what we'll be talking about. This course was really designed to give you a great overview of Google Cloud Networking Services. One of the challenges with learning a cloud platform is to understand how it all comes together. My goal throughout the course is to ensure over the next few hours that there's plenty of activities that are covered, we'll be performing demos, but also walking you through some design aspects as well. We'll be talking about how Google Cloud is structured. We'll talk about their infrastructure. We'll be proceeding and talking about managed and unmanaged services such as Cloud DNS and also how to set up a firewall. And then we'll be talking about network service tiers and also other aspects such as routing, IP management, but also some of the basics such as the virtual private cloud and also service accounts as well because one of the challenges with networking and other services is that it'll access Compute Engine and other services and therefore we need to enable our security with IAM and we'll want to know these aspects even if it's more networking focused for various reasons that we'll find out in the course. Then I'll go ahead and wrap up the course by talking about some of the Google Cloud Platform certification options. Lastly, before we go ahead and get started on the content, let's go ahead and talk about some of the prerequisites. 
this course was really designed for folks that already understand cloud networking. In other words, you've been working with the cloud quite a while and you probably know why you want to use a VPN and you probably understand the difference between platform as a service, software as a service. This is not meant to be a 101 course for someone that's not familiar with cloud computing. It would be helpful but not totally necessary to already have been playing around with Google Cloud. Perhaps you had a free tier and just trying to understand the basics. It would also be critical to have access to a Google Cloud platform, free tier or free credits, whatever may be available in your situation. We'll also be referring you to additional resources that you may or may not be aware of to enable your knowledge in Google Cloud. Lastly, we'll go ahead, of course, and talk about networking certification with Google Cloud Platform. However, I did want to ensure that this course was not going to cover the full objectives of the GCP networking certification. That certification is somewhat more advanced and there's a separate course that dives into the objectives of that certification. This course was meant to get you a foundational perspective. With that said, GCP really has some powerful capabilities for cloud networking. So let's go ahead and proceed and get started and talk about these great capabilities that are at your fingertips with Google Cloud. Now let's talk about some specific facets that are not directly networking, but of course will have a great effect uh, regarding your networking configurations and other points you're going to want to be familiar with. So let's talk about infrastructure regions and zones. And a lot of this you'll see will tie into a virtual private cloud, which we'll, of course, cover in the course as well. Now, what I've done is I've just added some terminology here. And if you're familiar with AWS, then you'll likely be able to correlate this fairly easily. One of the things to point out is that Google Cloud uses what's called regions and zones. And then we have an abstracted data center called a zone. Now, basically, the data center is going to be, of course, uh, in a specific region, and that region will have multiple zones. And we'll talk more about that coming up. There's a few maps we'll discuss. Then when it comes to Cloud CDN, this is a big deal because with CDN, Google Cloud actually caches at the edge, essentially, some of the services, and therefore, Unlike a lot of other CDNs that cache static content, this is more of a dynamic approach. And we'll talk about CDN in that section. Some other terms just to talk about will be the, um, uh, the backbones. Basically with Google Cloud, you'll see that they have a fairly uh, wide and globally distributed structure to their backbones. They have submarine lines. These are just some facets of the networking to understand because Google Cloud owns their infrastructure. And what makes it really nice is that you can basically go from one Google zone to another without having to leave the cloud for that matter. And we'll, of course, talk about how all that works. Then when it comes to clusters of DC services, data center services, Again, GCP has uh, 18 at the time of writing. There's uh, over 55 actually now at the time of writing uh, around abstracted data centers and then edge caching as well. Uh, basically with uh, Google's uh, POP CDN services, basically connect the data centers through a Google-owned fiber. And I'll also talk about how you can take advantage of Cloud Interconnect to directly connect from on-prem to one of Google's supported uh, edge locations. When it comes to terminology, the definitions are here. I think, you know, when it comes to networking, it is important, especially for load balancing and being able to understand how availability works, for example, 
between the zones, what we're going to have to do for managing our load balancing. We'll talk about a global IP and the different types of load balancing. Some might be supported uh, basically regionally. Some will be supported globally. We'll get into that. Just make sure you understand the terms from Google's perspective. Now, when it comes to regions and zones, again, it's really more coming down to best practices. When we're designing our network services, we want to take in mind that Google, of course, recommends multiple zones and multiple regions. So therefore, if we have an outage in a specific geo, let's say like Iowa, then we're not like stuck out of luck if that whole region's out for some reason, like a power grid issue, and it's not resolved fairly quickly. Again, Google's data centers can literally run for uh, you know, days on end uh, without having to have power per se. But with that said, something could occur where a region could go down. And if you're not covered, then you can, of course, have an outage with your company services. That is not good for your company's bottom line, I'm sure. Now, when we discuss like low latency network connections, I'll get into how Google's network is actually structured here shortly in the course. Now, here's an example of how the regions and zones are structured. Uh, this is, uh, again, at the time of writing, but as Google, of course, adds more regions that they've already announced, this is, of course, going to increase. Same thing with the map here. At the time of writing, we had 18 regions and 55 zones. But I do know that there will be, of course, uh, newer uh, data centers coming online, probably by the time at the end of uh, this year. With that said, um, always check to see what is available and check your latency between your on-prem services and also where your users are going to access the cloud services from and try to determine, especially in the US, uh, one of the challenges is trying to determine, especially like between Iowa and Northern Virginia, especially if you're centrally located, uh, for example. With that said, um, check your latency. GC ping is a good way to get initial approach to that. And I'll talk about GC ping throughout the course. But also there's other tools like Cloud Harmony that could work as well. Let's go ahead and move on and get to the next section. This course, I'm going to really be focusing on the main areas around networking, for example. And I'll talk about areas around projects and how to pair them together. But we'll spend most of our time talking about, essentially, networking, which is down here. So we'll be focusing on VPC networks. We'll create a VPC. We'll also create firewall rules. We'll talk about routes and subnets. We'll also talk about the difference between network peering and a shared VPC. We'll then get into load balancing. We'll talk about cloud DNS and content delivery. I'll also show you how to enable CDN as well. And then we'll also talk about why we may want to have a NAT server and why we may want to have a Bastion host. We'll also talk about the connectivity options of how to connect to Google Cloud and why you may want to use Cloud VPN or Cloud Interconnect, for example. I'll also talk about the great benefits of network service tiers and why that's really important to appreciate. And then we will talk about network security as well. So that's what we're going to be focused on in this course. Uh, and then we'll also um, touch on stack driver as well as far as like VPC logging, for example. And then we'll have one section on identity and access management, which will be focused mainly on network based roles, uh, such as service accounts or network administrative roles that uh, need to access virtual machines, for example. That's what I'll be focusing on. We won't be focusing on the rest of the areas in Google Cloud. That's another subject for another course. So let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to learn. Let's talk about the organizational hierarchy and what projects are. Now, when we're designing 
our Google Cloud Platform services, it's really important to understand how projects work in Google Cloud. And another reason that we, we really want to know what projects can do is understand where the organizational foundation can come in, especially if we're using G Suite, for example. But another scenario that we'll be talking about is VPC peering, for example, and why we may want to have a shared VPC as well. And they're very different use cases, but have some similarities. So let's clarify what a project is. And then in the course, we'll be talking about a shared VPC and what peering is as well with projects and how all that can work. From a networking perspective, it could be very powerful, but also it induces some other challenges that we'll want to consider, especially if we're designing our CEDAR ranges, our firewall planning, our VPCs, and that's why we really need to talk about projects and the organizational structure before we get into the networking part. All right, so let's talk about first what a project is. Now, in Google Cloud, we have a project. The goal of this is to facilitate the organization of our services, our objects, but basically what this is saying is we're going to be able to organize our resources for billing purposes and accounting purposes as well. It also can provide a form of chargeback, showback, etc. But with that said, it's a really strong structure and it gets even more powerful if you're using G Suite or Cloud Identity as well. Now, one of the, the things about a project to understand is that there's three parts to the naming structure that you'll want to know to identify it. We want to realize that a project can have a project name, a project ID, and a project number. I'll get to that in one sec, but I did want to reinforce, for example, why we want to have a project. First of all, just realize it's meant to track resources and quota usage. Now, also, too, when we spin up our APIs and our services, if the service isn't being used, then by default, those APIs aren't going to be on. So if you need to have, for example, the, the um, services around, for example, a Deployment Manager, Compute Engine, um, App Engine, etc., the uh, Speech API, whatever APIs it may be, by default, those uh, APIs are not going to be spun up automatically. But with that said, we need to realize that it's a form of segmentation. It's sort of like a sandbox in a sandbox is the way I like to call a project. Now, when it comes to naming and, and how that's structured, we have a project name, a project ID, and a project number. We can identify the name when we create it as well as a project ID. We can change the project number that's assigned by Google. Now, the important thing to uh, realize is that the project ID we're going to be referring to pretty uh, routinely when we structure our account structure. So it could be for service accounts, for example, as well. Then we have folders that come into play. And if we're using cloud identity and access management, then this can add extra layers of granularity. I won't be covering... Uh, for example, folders in this course, that's more the security course or the architect and engineering course. But I did want to make you aware that there is a structure with Cloud IAM that could be used. And this could definitely affect, for example, permissions and also how you structure your firewall services. Now, what about the whole hierarchy? Well, generally, when it comes to the organization, if we're running G Suite, we're running Cloud Identity, we're going to have typically an organization. And what that means is we can take our organizational structure, our lifecycle management, and propagate that to Google Cloud. But what's also nice is that we could tie this in with GCDS, for example, Google Cloud Directory Services, and actually um, propagate our Active Directory LDAP services from on-prem 
and also sync up into Google Cloud Services as well. Now again, that's more security focused, but it is important to understand the structure because there's going to be some networking configuration to deal with, and it's important that I at least discuss it at least at a high level to get you to that point. So basically, we have organizations. This is a top level domain. Uh, another thing to point out if you're not familiar with orgs, as uh, they're called by short, it basically it it's a domain that you're going to have a top level domain like mycompanya.com or gcpgurus.com or whatever the name is, and we're going to want to tie that into our G Suite services, for example. Then we have folders, that's Cloud IAM, that's part of that structure. Then projects is a default. When we first get going, we have one project. It's usually called my project and a number. And then we have resources that are under that project. So that's going to be, for example, App Engine. That could be uh, Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine. Could also be Cloud Storage or Cloud SQL, etc. So those are resources. Now again, I won't dive too deep into the structure. Uh, sort of the expectation is that you probably have some experience with this. But basically, I do want to make sure that we get some of the things we need to think about. For example, if you look under the middle green area here, project.tf, you could see, for example, we have project APIs. And those APIs are going to be spun up only in that project. Also note, too, that when we have our organization over here, we might have an organizational project. And under this project, we're going to have, for example, different types of accounts, like a service account, user accounts. But with that said, if we're using cloud identity and access management, we, of course, want to be aware that we're going to have a different security posture than if we didn't use, for example, Cloud IM with folders and granularity, but also too, we'll get into throughout some of the demos, for example, in the course, we'll talk about permissioning and, and why that's really important as well. Now, when it comes to our projects, for example, and how the organization ties in, we want to think about it from a perspective of a top down approach. And it could be centralized from a perspective that an organization with a top level domain, such as GCP Gurus or MyCompany.com, can go ahead in and basically import all these projects that are part of an organization. Whether it's one or 200, we go ahead and bring them under the organization and maintain centralized control of those projects. This can provide really good benefits in some cases. In some other cases, it may not, depending on how the company culture is and how management uh, handles, for example, resource allocation, chargeback, uh, other services, for example, too, such as governance. All of these things can play, of course, into your GCP cloud structure. When it comes to Google Cloud accounts, again, if we're using G Suite, we're likely going to have a life cycle with that be propagated. Once again, this is just something to pay attention to if we do go down that road from a, a company perspective that you may be working in. With that said, when we talk about projects, one of the notes that I think is important to realize is that resources can have a perspective of a global resource where that resource such as a um, IP address that could be used for load balancing would be a global resource. A regional resource, for example, is only used in that region. For example, App Engine is a regional resource. Also too, we'll talk about from a routing and networking perspective, IP addresses and what is regional, zonal, and global as well when we get into some of the demos. And then zonal resources. This, for example, might be a resource that can only be located in a zone. It can't be moved around or modified uh, per se to move around to another um, region, for example. And that would be an example, for, uh, for example, a 
compute engine instance that might actually be um, attached to, with a local SSD or might have an image and that image is actually attached to that VM. And it again, that can't be moved until it's deattached from the VM. And that's why from a networking perspective, we wanna get an idea of different types of resources that are global, regional, and zonal. When it comes to G Suite, this uh, again is a part of Google Cloud that we must know from an organizational perspective if we do have customers or organization that we're already in is looking at uh, this from an organizational perspective instead of a project level. Also too, this can definitely affect, for example, um, what about if we want a peer or if we want to uh, also tie in our resource management. Also too, uh, billing could be affected as well if we exceed, for example, certain thresholds. For example, egress versus ingress traffic and how is that handled as well? And then as far as quotas, quotas are going to be, of course, part of a project and that is a limited number of resources in that project to use. How many APIs can be spun up? How many other um, resources such as Compute Engine instances could be spun up? What other APIs have to be spun up as well? Also note too that there's free quotas that are available and also paid quotas that are available as well. You can always try to scale your quotas if you do exceed, for example, um, the number of uh, projects. Uh, for example, you'd always put in a request to Google support to get that up. The quotas are not only in place to keep, for example, um, you in check from a customer perspective from spinning up too many other resources, but it also prevents performance issues and also allows Google to manage their cloud in the most effective way that they can. Let's go ahead and move on and get into some of the uh, deeper material. Let's talk about networking at a high level. So we'll do a quick overview and then we go into the subject areas such as VPC, VPN, firewalls, etc., in a much deeper level with the course demos, whiteboards throughout the course. So let's go ahead and just talk about the main features uh, and benefits of using Google Cloud and some of the networking fundamentals you may want to know about. First of all, Google's investments in networking is quite impressive. If you go over to the peering website that they have and also go ahead and look at their submarine lines, etc., it's pretty impressive. For example, Google's um, submarine line capability at least of their older cables, or laying new cables, of course, as we speak, uh, is approximately 10 terabytes. So that's pretty impressive. Now, when you're using Google Cloud, you're essentially going over a private network and you're not traversing the internet. Now, this is, a, of course, a big deal because if you're using Compute Engine in the US and you want to go ahead and access App Engine in Europe or something, then you're not worried about traversing the internet to get there. You're going over Google's backbone. With Google Cloud, for example, um, latency is actually pretty low uh, compared to AWS in some cases. Again, this is all a, what I call a tit for tat debate, but you go ahead, for example, and use Cloud Harmony. And I know with some customers, the latency is somewhat lower than it is uh, to AWS. And a lot of that too could depend on the service that you're using as well because Google Cloud does actually cache, for example, um, cloud storage and App Engine at the edge uh, as well in a lot of cases. There's a tool that, um, there's a demo uh, I'll talk about at the end of the course uh, that I go through GC Ping. Uh, and that's a good one to use. And then if you use already AWS now, then you're familiar with cloudping.info. Now, Cloud Harmony is a tool that will check all the cloud uh, vendors that participate uh, in allowing uh, the service to 
uh, pull their enterprise services. Now, Google launched one of the first network service tiers, and this is, of course, a big deal. There's two tiers. We have a standard tier where you go ahead and save some money by traversing outside of Google Cloud, basically going over the internet to get from point A to point B. And then premium tier is, is of course, going over Google's network, which is low latency and, of course, very reliable. Now, when we talk about some terminology around networking, uh, most of these terms you've probably already heard of, but just in case. Now, a virtual private cloud in Google is somewhat familiar uh, to what you're already doing in AWS, but there's some, of course, differences in how this, of course, is deployed and, and managed for that matter. For example, in Google, we know that the VPC network is going to be broader than what AWS does. In Google, it's really a global resource that's going to span all the regions in that project. Another thing, too, this is all deployed with software-defined networking that Google also uses for their own enterprise services internally. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is that when you deploy a VPC, you literally have direct reach via typically Google's fiber network to your other services in Google Cloud. So think of the VPC um, as a global resource and not regional. In AWS, of course, it is a regional service. So just be aware of that. Now, DNS, uh, Cloud DNS is Google's managed cloud service. It's the only cloud service that really has essentially a guarantee of uh, five nines. And then CDN, Cloud CDN, uh, again, things are handled differently uh, via Cloud CDN and CloudFront. Again, um, if you want really more details between GCP and AWS, I have a course called GCP for AWS Professionals that I teach both online and, and uh, in person, live and, and recorded that goes into much more details where I walk you through the bit by bit scenarios. But basically, cloud CDN, a lot of the benefits of CDN uh, with Google is that uh, it's at the edge, but also they cache a lot of their services such as S3, uh, excuse me, such as cloud storage with Google. And App Engine is another service as well that uh, is, is cached at the edge with Cloud CDN. So there is some really good benefits uh, as well that could be enhanced with Google Cloud. Now, Cloud Interconnect uh, is essentially direct connect in AWS. And load balancing, um, again, is somewhat different. Uh, in Google, it's a managed service, whereas in AWS, it's a manual process in a lot of respects. Uh, you also have challenges with warming up and warming down and uh, also worrying about some other um, connection drops that can happen. But in Google Cloud, load balancing, no matter what the load balancing is, uh, whether it's network or regional uh, or global uh, types like HTTPS, um, for example, it is a managed service. With tiering, um, there is a network service tier in Google. Now, AWS does have sort of a, a, a similar approach uh, to a degree with network service tiers, but it's not really comparable technically, so I don't even really get too much into that. Okay, now, what do we want to focus on here as far as virtual machines? One, once again, with virtual machines, we want to think about Google offering global networking capabilities. We also want to think about Google offering regional capabilities as well. It's up to us to decide how we want to deploy our virtual machines. Now, one of the things about a virtual machine in Google is that this virtual machine is a global resource if it we're going to deploy it. So it gives us a lot more flexibility. In AWS, things are a little different. Another thing, too, um, is, again, think of a virtual machine and compute engine as a global resource. And we don't need to have peering as well if we so choose. So that's another nice little benefit. Now, here's an example of how a traditional VPC would be deployed with major cloud providers. With Google, this is how it would be deployed. 
you could see that we have US East and US West. Instead of going through the internet to get from, you know, Compute Engine uh, over to another service or server, then um, we would normally, if we go with another provider, have to go through the internet to get to, um, uh, to, to get to the service or the server that we're trying to get to. With that said, going over Google's VPC provides some great benefits around security, latency, performance, etc. Right. Now, another thing too with Google, it's really uh, interesting because you are not only able to connect to the edge as efficiently as possible, but Google actually owns their own lines going to a lot of the edges depending on your location. So this is a big deal because it really enables you as a customer to connect literally to the last mile in a lot of cases to Google's network. And again, a lot of other cloud providers can't go that far and don't invest like that either. Now, networking in Google Cloud is global. We want to think of networking in Google as a default network, a custom, or an auto. Uh, when we deployed the VPC, that VPC was a virtual private cloud, and we know that all the uh, resources are able to connect up with everyone globally. So basically, when we create a subnet, we're by default able to get from Brazil to the US in that same network that we just created. When it comes to networking services, um, again, Google references their uh, IP addresses via DHCP, of course, internally. And then external, we have the ability to get uh, a pool of um, IPs we could use, or we get a static IP as well. It's really up to us. When it comes to DNS, um, again, Google Cloud has a managed service called Cloud DNS. And Cloud DNS is a managed service, uh, as, of course, we're aware. But basically, what this is really unique is if we go down here, Google Cloud provides basically better than 5.9 availability. So 100% on their SLA. And, and uh, this is on their uh, ANS servers, essentially. So this is really a big deal. And again, it's managed from a customer perspective. There's very little work we have to do. We just have to update basically our records and everything else is handled in the background, um, basically by Google, uh, great SLA. And what's really nice about this too um, is that uh, we could manage and monitor our services um, as effectively as we want as well with Stackdriver, for example. So Cloud DNS is actually a great service to consider as well from a networking perspective. Now, what I want to do here is do a quick little walkthrough of some other networking services just to talk about. Now, we also have, for example, uh, under networking um, throughout the course, I'll be talking about a lot of these services, such as the VPC, load balancing, um, interconnect, cloud VPN, etc. But again, um, a lot of great resources on how networking is actually handled and also around best practices as well. So I encourage you to take a look at the website and view the documentation for each of these products. It's really critical um, that you understand how this is all handled. Now, the other thing to point out as well, in one of the previous modules, there are some maps that you go ahead and look at for peering and also their cabling structure, uh, interconnection structure. Pretty nice. Um, Google really does a great job at laying out their documentation. All right, let's go ahead and proceed on. Let's talk about what a virtual private cloud is. Now, a virtual private cloud is known as a VPC for short, and essentially a VPC is a global private isolated virtual network partition that provides managed network functionality for your GCP resources. Now, these resources are going to be, of course, your projects, and these projects are going to have a VPC network, which will contain subnets, routes, firewalls, DNS information, etc. 
And when we decide on how we're going to structure our resources in the VPC, it's important to uh, realize a few things, that there's different modes, for example. The first thing is, when we create a VPC, we have basically subnets that are listed here, for example. And in the demo, we'll go through and deploy a VPC and talk a lot more about the options. But generally, just think of a VPC as a way that you could allow access from every region to every region or vice versa. You go ahead and use a default VPC, which is showing right here, which is going to have essentially a subnet to all the Google Cloud regions by default. Now, this allows you uh, several benefits when you deploy a default VPC. At least it gets you started, and then you work your way back if you don't need to have access uh, to certain regions and zones for compliance purposes, etc. Now, it is also important to realize that a VPC is essentially a global resource. And when we deploy a VPC, we want to think about it as a virtual version of a typical physical network, essentially. Especially if you've done a lot of networking, you can appreciate, for example, that you're going to define a physical network and have, of course, IP addresses, subnets, routing, etc. Now, when we deploy the VPC, one more thing is that in the example here, we have different subnets. Now, when this is created by a default here, this also provides you some benefits that when you first create your project in GCP, you don't have to go in and uh, create your network configs to access Google Cloud resources, for example, in other regions, which is, again, another subnet. So this provides some benefits there. Now, when it comes to some other areas of focus around a VPC, it's a global communication space. Remember, it's a global area of resources that you're configuring in Google Cloud that's a sandbox. It's a virtual network that spans the globe, basically, with Google Cloud. Now, generally, these services can be computer GCP services, of course. We can also have a shared VPC, provide hybrid support, private peering, and also just note that there's two types of VPCs, we have auto and custom mode. In the demo, we'll go through this and talk a lot more about these features and capabilities. Now, when it comes to VPC features, another thing to note is that this global communication space, which is a VPC, is going through the Google backbone directly. You're not going basically via an external IP address outside to get to another region. You're going directly over Google's well-provisioned, low-latency network. And this is different than a lot of other cloud providers. There's two modes, auto mode and custom mode. Uh, again, fairly straightforward. Basically, auto mode is going to be automatically created for you. Uh, when you first log in and get started with VPC, you'll notice that, again, there'll be 20, uh, at the time of writing, 20 regions. So you'll have 20 subnets created for you. Now, again, by the time you may take the course a few months down the road, Google will have deployed another region or two, which is already announced on the roadmap. So, again, whatever that number is, uh, we'll talk more in the demo, of course about how to find out. Now, custom mode, again, we want to create a custom mode if we're going to, for example, deploy a production environment and, again, want to have this connected, for example, to our on-prem resources or to have a production app that's going to be around a while. In other words, we want to control our IP range. We want to be able to have a custom CEDA range. Now, VPC peering allows us to have connectivity between two VPCs. So, for example, 
if we want to connect, for example, one company to another company, we can do that. They don't even have to be part of the same company or organization. Now, this gives us some benefits, especially like in an organization that might have bought another company and you want to go ahead and bring them together. So basically like an organization that uh, wants to just peer with another organization. Another use case too could also be um, listed here basically around having different network domains as well. For example, it's very common for a multinational company to have, even though they're part of the same company, to have different admin domains in their networking structure. Now, some of the other highlights to note is that each project contains one or more VPCs. So for example, if you have 20 projects, you're going to have essentially 20 VPCs at a minimum. However, you can have 10 VPCs in each project if you want as well. It's up to you on how you want to deploy your resources in GCP. Again, remember it's a global entity. Now, when we say global entity, it is going to span all the Google resources in every GCP region without actually traversing to the internet. Now, this VPC network allows your VMs to communicate with other resources on the Google Cloud backend network. When we also, too, when we create, for example, our first project, we're going to, of course, have this VPC created. And we could also choose auto mode or custom mode, as we know. But basically, we're going to need to deploy our resources as quickly and efficiently as possible. And again, the network will have our subnets, routes, also firewall rules. We'll talk about all that in the demo in more detail. Also note that we want to just keep in mind that resources could be global, regional, or zonal resources. Just because you have a regional resource in a VPC does not make it a global resource. That resource has to be able to span. For example, you can move templates around. On the other hand, subnets are actually regional resources, so just be aware of that. We'll talk more about resources in the course. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the demo. Let's go ahead and create a virtual private cloud. Now, there's a couple different ways to go ahead and create a VPC. We create a VPC with the CLI. We could go ahead and create it, of course, here in the console. And to get to VPC network, we could type in up in the search VPC network, for example. And this will bring us to the menu that we want to go to. Another way to get there is just to scroll on down and go to networking and then select VPC network as well. Now, when we consider creating a VPC, we want to realize, first of all, that a VPC is going to be used to create this global network in Google Cloud. Essentially, we're going to go ahead and deploy this virtual private cloud to be able to access resources in other regions and zones in Google Cloud. And when we deploy this, especially if we deploy in the auto mode, it'll go ahead and deploy a subnet based on each of the regions. And you can see that the default VPC, which is actually created for you by Google when you launch your uh, cloud service, when you first create your account and deploy your project, um, you'll have a VPC by default, and the default one is listed here. Now, I don't have any other VPCs created yet, so what we want to do is create a separate VPC and walk you through some of the options so you have an idea of how to get started. Now, the first thing we want to do is go over here and select Create VPC. When we select Create VPC, there's some information we're going to want to uh, plan for uh, basically down the road. And some of this could be as simple as you just putting in whatever you want or actually planning this out. Now, generally, when we create a VPC, we want to create a name that's going to uh, make sense. In this case here, I'm going to call this uh, basically, uh, in this case here, 
I'll call this VPC test network and I can put in a description if I want and then if I want I could go ahead and create basically additional subnets now this is the custom mode if I want to not worry about having a cedar range that I need to create and creating these uh, subnets manually for each region then I could just go over here to automatic now one of the things to point out about automatic is that it'll go ahead and create a subnet for each of the regions listed so in this case there'll be 20 subnets because that's the number of regions that are available at the time of writing the course with that said the IP ranges will go ahead and be selected for you and you don't have to worry about creating this now a couple things to point out with this first is the firewall rules and then we need to look at for example a couple other factors such as the routing mode and the DNS policy as well now if we're deploying this for like a development scenario and it's non-production then this may not be so much of a big deal however if it is for production you need to be very careful with the firewall rules and, and again it goes without saying do we want to allow access into Google Cloud to our virtual machines and what are the protocols we're going to allow now ICMP TCP for example uh, as well and now 3389 is of course RDP and then port 22 is of course SSH now there's two firewall rules that cannot be adjusted and that's the ingress and egress rules basically that say deny and allow all now these are known as implied firewall rules in Google Cloud now basically the implied allow egress rule is going to go ahead and allow instances and other resources that are in the GCP network to go ahead and make outgoing requests and then receive whatever established responses are there then the implied deny ingress rule blocks all incoming traffic to GCP resources so this is where you get to pay attention um, on how you configure the uh, ingress rules above as well because again you need to again create your firewall rules that are going to allow ingress traffic from essentially your um, on-prem network your peer network whatever uh, you're setting it up for but you may also need to create egress rules as well and deny certain types of traffic so you need to pay attention to that and we'll talk more about this in the firewall part of the course so just be aware of that now we have dynamic routing mode now there's two modes that are available there's regional and global now if we select global we need to pay attention to the warning here if you're using internal load balancing then um, you need to reconsider basically because again um, that's more of a regional service not a global service and then also too we need to look at um, how we're configuring our VPN and if we're using dedicated interconnect vice versa uh, remember too that dedicated interconnect and cloud VPN do not work together at least they're not suited to and then we have the DNS policy now we go ahead and create a new server policy which basically is going to uh, allow logging for example in Stackdriver so basically these are going to be um, traffic essentially logs that are generated by DNS requests etc and then query forwarding this is inbound and this is of course going to log any kind of requests that are coming into Google Cloud uh, through um, the, the DNS server that you're using and then you could also add additional DNS servers as well but in this case um, we just simply want to go ahead and create a firewall rule so you could see and basically to do this at the VPC level is fairly straightforward all we want to do in this case let's say we want to be able to SSH in let's say we want to go and log into our Linux servers 
we want to go ahead and allow port 22 to be open. Then also, too, I could allow ICMP requests. For example, maybe I want to go ahead and have monitoring from my on-prem, monitoring, for example, Google Cloud. We want to, of course, allow that, let's say. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and allow SSH in this case um, and get it started. Now, if I'm going to use stack driver monitoring, um, again, this does not have to be selected because the monitoring with stack driver is essentially coming through Google's network. So that's another nice, nice, no, nice, uh, nice to have, I guess, as well. So we want to go create. Now, when we create this, you'll see that up at the top here, we have notifications. And this will go ahead and spin around until it's actually done. It doesn't take too long, it takes less than a minute, usually. We'll come back to that when it's done. Now, the VPC network has just completed, and you see that uh, when we scroll up here, that we have our default VPC and then the VPC test network that we just created. Now, you can see that we have 20 subnets created, one for each region, and same thing here. This is our uh, CETA range or subnet uh, ranges, that is, and everything is listed there. Now, what we could do is I could go in and select the VPC test network, and it'll tell me more about the um, VPC that we just created, gives me the gateway, gives me information if I have flow logging on, uh, et cetera, as well. And I also have the REST um, response that I could take, copy and paste it into my code that I'm developing locally so I can go ahead and access the VPC as well if I so choose in my programs as well. So again, that is really uh, about all to talk about with creating a default VPC, fairly straightforward. And to create a custom one is extremely similar. It's just that you'll need to manually plug in each of the subnets and whatever range that you would require. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about identity and access management in Google Cloud and focus more on networking. Now, when it comes to identity and access management, I just want to start out by comparing sort of AWS to GCP so that folks that are familiar with AWS can get an idea of where um, this really compares. So first of all, um, there's a lot of similarities uh, for example, with AWS, you're going to use individual accounts and groups. But with GCP, again, you have the ability to use outside uh, users as well. You have the ability to attach bindings as well. And I'll talk more about um, how roles can come into play. Uh, the API um, does provide a URI uh, for HTTP requests. And this is going to be all, of course, done through the project. And that's probably the most substantial differentiator here. Now, when it comes to Google Cloud, uh, it's important to realize that everything really does come down to the project in a lot of cases. So if you're managing a project or three projects or 30, uh, you'll need to pay attention to the roles that you're giving out, your keys, Remember, we deploy keys on a um, project level or on a VM level. Allows us to, to uh, handle key management in several factors. Uh, we'll need to look at auditing as well. And then also when it comes to policies, remember Google's best practice for IAM is to allow um, users to be part of a group and then basically make that group uh, basically part of a role as well. So basically like uh, uh, an app engine, probably an app engine viewer, let's say, right? Or whatever service we're talking about. Now, if we're talking about networking, some of the roles that uh, we may want to grant uh, would be like a network user or a VPC admin, a security admin. We may want to grant access to a service account for basically compute instance admin, for example. So a lot of things to consider here. Now, with Google Cloud, IAM does come down to uh, a couple things. 
First of all, you want to grant access to members, and these members can be part of any of these um, type of accounts. Basically, they could be part of a Google account, a service account, a Google group, a G Suite domain, or cloud identity domain. Now, one of the things to think about is, let's say you're a large organization, and you want to go ahead and deploy services so that a team can manage it. Well, you want to go ahead and create a group and then add the appropriate roles and permissions to that group and then add the users to the group. That's really the best practice around that. So, for example, you, you may want to have your network admins have access to um, a shared VPC as an administrator. However, the developers really shouldn't have access to the shared VPC as an administrator. You don't really want them mucking around, right? Now, you may want to grant permissions to use specific subnets, specific VPCs as well. A lot of things to talk about here. I'm going to go to a demo here shortly and talk more about this. Now, one of the things when managing projects, uh, we want to look at an organization. And if we have an organization and we're running a G Suite uh, top-level domain, then we can go ahead and devise a strategy to import the projects into the organization and be able to manage all the projects as one entity, basically more centralized. But on the other hand, we could go ahead and just have an organization set up and have the projects part of the organization, but let the projects handle uh, permissioning however they want. A lot of different options here. So the org node is going to allow us to use our own mechanisms for authentication and also our credentials. Now, federation, again, is a typically a best practice. So if we want to federate our identities to Google Cloud, we can certainly do that. We probably want to use GCDS as part of this as well. When it comes to roles, there's different types of roles in uh, GCP. We have primitive, curated, and custom roles. Generally, you're going to want to use a curated or custom. A primitive role um, is not very granular. The access that's given is pretty broad. Service accounts. Now, a service account is going to be an account we're going to want to use for our programs to connect server to server. It is not a user account, it is a service account, meaning that it is going to be for a service from a server. We want to be able to have this service account to authenticate, uh, for example, with the Compute Engine instance to access resources, uh, for example, as well. We want to make sure that we grant uh, the right uh, permission to the right resource to the right member with the right role. For example, a compute instance admin may be, you know, again, what we might need to um, provision, for example, to someone deploying VMs. When it comes to projects, a service account is identified as the following. It's always going to be cloudservices.gserviceaccount.com. Anytime you see that, you know that it's a service account. For example, with App Engine, there's different levels of permission. And then there's an invitation workflow as well. What we want to do is basically send an invitation, basically have uh, the member uh, select the link, click the link, and then accept it, and then log in to Google Cloud. So let's go ahead over and take a quick look at a web page before we move on. Now, on this web page here, this is uh, actually IAM roles for networking related job functions, for example. Just one of the many resources to look at. This is giving you some examples for granting permission to the right uh, roles, the right members of a team. For example, if you have an organization or you have a host project or a service project, you want to look at different roles. For example, if you have uh, an organization, they probably want to be um, a shared VPC admin, a network admin, a security admin, etc. You want to give them the right role for the right member. 
Now, if it's a developer we're talking about, they don't really need access to the organization. It's more for the project. They may be a network user. A network user meaning what? They go ahead in and deploy resources. They go ahead in, provision subnets, etc. Then the service project, remember, is more or less what? It is a service account. This is a role that allows, for example, to um, access external IPs. If we scroll down here, it gives us a lot more information on how to bind our project together. Uh, your developers would definitely want to take a look at this. And then if we scroll down here, we go ahead and give different uh, roles. And again, there's a whole list of options here for you to look at. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about networking in Google Cloud. Now, what I like to do is I set up a short little whiteboard here to walk you through some of the facets and terminology and features that are part of Google Cloud. So the first thing I want to point out here is we have um, a couple things to cover. The first is we have an org node. And because we have an org node, this allows us to bring in our projects, basically. And I'll go ahead and um, what I'll do is I'll just basically say this is uh, project uh, dev and project test. And let's just say they're part of the um, development group. And then over here we have our production. So I'll call this uh, project prod as well, just to make it simple and uh, sync up. But basically, if we go back to my pen, what we could do is this organization, let's say our company is mycompanya.com. And because mycompanya.com is a global company, so on and so on, we may have uh, many uh, Google projects out there. And we want to make sure that we have some kind of centralized control over our billing, over our management, etc. So what we want to do is go ahead and create an org node and bring in each of these projects under the organization. What this does is it's going to allow the organizational administrator to basically manage each of these projects as much or as little as they want. In other words, the organizational admin could have full control over each of the projects or no control. It's really up to, to what they want to do. For example, maybe you want to have a master billing account and that's probably the best way to do it. On the other hand, let's say you want each department to go ahead and pay for their own services through their OPEX uh, funds. So you might want to give them permission to manage their own projects. Anyways, what makes sense in a lot of situations is this. Let's say we want to go ahead and create what's called a CI pipeline. Now a CI pipeline or a CD pipeline, depending on what we're doing, is we're going to want to roll out basically software improvements basically through uh, automation. And to do that, we want to be able to have access between the projects. So for example, the project um, development and project test, for example, might be paired together. So I'll go ahead and go over here. And what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and text that in so you can see it, is um, they might just be uh, network peered, right? Now, when we perform network peering, what we're doing is, is we're bringing these two projects together and it's providing some benefits. One of the benefits is that it's really useful for a SaaS ecosystem. It's also useful for situations where there's different network admin domains that you want to peer together. So for example, even though you want to have a separate project for dev, test, and production, they're all in the same company, but you want development and production to have their own resources and manage them effectively. Now, with network peering, this is going to allow us to reduce, for example, our latency in a lot of cases, improve our security, and reduce our network cost as well. With that said, there's a lot of other um, 
a great benefit. So peering is going to work with Compute Engine, GKE, and App Engine flexible environment. Now, peering does not work with the um, standard environment, so just be aware of that. Allows us to have basically administrative separation in the sense that we could have separate routes, firewalls, uh, and other tools as well if we so choose. That's another great benefit. Uh, another thing too is we could also um, create basically an association when we pair. And when we do that, we have the uh, ability to import and export routes if we want. We could have uh, basically static routes uh, as well. And if we do, they're going to be global routes. Dynamic routes would be typically a regional or global, depending on the routing mode that you're using. Now, when we peer traffic, for example, the traffic flowing between the two networks, for example, will have the same latency throughout and therefore availability as well. And it's basically private traffic, which is actually really nice. So that's one option. But what about if we don't have an organization or perhaps we do? Now, when it comes to um, network peering, we have the ability to connect up to either our same uh, organization um, that we want. In other words, the VPCs are basically in the same organization. But we can also um, look at it from this perspective. If we have multiple admin domains in the organization, then this is going to allow us to make services basically available between um, VPC networks and what's typically a private um, IP space. We could also offer services to other orgs as well. So let's go ahead and talk about another option called a shared VPC. Now, a shared VPC will let us, if we're, now one of the things about a shared VPC is that it, it, it has to have an organization set up to work. So if we don't have an organization set up, then we can't use a shared VPC. We can only consider basically network peering. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So if we have an org node, then we probably would want to use basically a shared VPC, depending on the use case. And Again, that's if we do. If we don't, then we're going to want to consider peering. Uh, and again, there are some restrictions there as well. So just pay attention to that. So we have a few options for connecting up uh, different projects. Now let's talk about what do we do if we want to access our projects from, let's say, on-prem. Well, let's say uh, we have our on-prem resources here. And we also have, for example, in Google Cloud, we're using what's called um, Cloud DNS and Cloud VPN. And we also, in Google Cloud, have a NAT service. So let's just talk about these services briefly. So I'm going to go ahead and call this NAT, and I'm going to call this basically uh, DNS, and then VPN. Now. What about if I have my on-prem user base, and give me one sec to just draw this out here, and I have my user base that is going to access Google Cloud from different regions and different zones. Again, I'm just going to draw that real quick. Now, let me go ahead and change my color, change my pen, and basically, let's say we have our users here, And these users want to access Google Cloud. Well, we, what we really should do, first of all, is we have a couple connection options. So we could go over here, and actually, let me go ahead and type in a few things. Um, we could use Cloud Interconnect if we want to have um, a private IP low-latency connection. So I'll just leave it like that. 
then we could also use Cloud VPN uh, as well. So, for example, and then we could also um, peer uh, as well. But basically, let's just say we just want to connect up. Uh, we don't need to have like low latency connection. And, and let's say it's not even available in our region, uh, like Cloud Interconnect or Partner Interconnect. So what we want to do is this. We want to be able to connect our, our user base to Google Cloud. So what we want to do is have a gateway VPN here to Cloud VPN. Now, Cloud VPN is a managed gateway service, and it's going to be basically supporting only gateway to gateway, you know, tunneling is really what it's going to do. So it's going to be a point-to-point -point connection from on-prem to Google Cloud. Now, that's for us to connect. Now, let's say, for example, I want to have a bunch of SSH connections, and I want to control how each of these project resources are accessed. So for example, I might have VMs running in each of these projects. And again, I'm just drawing this nice and quickly, or other resources that have to be accessed. So what we want to do in Google Cloud is to set up a Compute Engine instance and basically call this what is, you know, basically set it up um, as an SSH concentrator, which would be what? it would be a bastion host. So I'll just call that a BH, just because of space purposes. And so the next thing we want to do is let's go ahead and change my color here, is after the users access their gateway VPN, they connect up to cloud VPN, they're going to jump off their SSH connection to the bastion host, which is basically an SSH concentrator and then access the, v, uh, the VMs that they're going to access in each of these projects. So again, this gives us a lot of flexibility in how we deploy our services. Now, if we want to use Cloud Interconnect, then we wouldn't be using Cloud VPN because we would have a private, secure, low latency connection between on-prem and Google Cloud. Basically, we'd be connecting directly to Google's peering point of presence. Now, there's so much more to talk about, but for the purposes of this whiteboard, I think that's a pretty good coverage of some of the little factoids. But before I close out, what we could also do, for example, is use cloud DNS. So if we don't want to use our on-premises DNS or another DNS service, we could also use um, Google Cloud DNS. This is a managed DNS service that allows us to um, basically direct um, our traffic however we want to have basically our name services managed by Google. Now this is the only service that pretty much any cloud provider um, offers at 100% availability, which is actually pretty unique. And we'll talk more about cloud DNS um, as well. And, and yes, it supports, you know, full capabilities with MX records and um, all that, domain transfers, etc. And then we could also consider a NAT server as well, if we so choose. This allows us to basically not have to worry about our virtual machines and our users directing traffic outside of Google Cloud um, and having our IPs found out. So basically, NAT is what? Network address translation. Generally, you want to have a NAT server so that you're basically ensuring that uh, your IPs are not disclosed to the public, your, your proper ones, right? And again, some other reasons as well. But with that said, I think we covered that pretty well. Let's go ahead and move on. Now, let's talk about a nice utility called Google Cloud Directory Services. Now, this is really an extension of G Suite, and this would allow you as an organization to extend out a lifecycle from your G Suite deployment to Google Cloud Platform. And it would essentially extend your on-prem directory services to Google Cloud and G Suite as well. So it's a one-way sync, essentially, is what it, it will do. Now, this is a secure tool. It's going to keep track of your users and groups. 
And again, what's really nice about this is that it's going to um, essentially take uh, basically a comparison between your LDAP server on-prem, let's say, or Active Directory, whatever you're using, and then compare it to what is in the cloud. And then if there's any changes, it'll update that information from on-prem to the cloud services in G Suite. Essentially, that, that's the benefit of this. So if you're working with G Suite and you have to deal with Active Directory or LDAP, and you want to integrate Google Cloud, then this tool is really a great tool. Now, if you're not using this, then um, you may be doing more work than you need, especially if you are using G Suite. If you're not, then this isn't going to be um, too helpful. But with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next subject. Let's talk about load balancing in Google Cloud. Now, the first thing to point out is that Google Cloud and load balancing is a managed service, unlike some other competitors. GCP is a managed service and is fully global. So let's talk about some of the differences before I move on. The first thing is, with load balancing, it is fully managed. You can, of course, have a static IP. You can also use load balancing based on content, um, source IP, whatever you want. You have some flexibility protocols. It supports cross-region. Scaling pattern is in real time, and it is a global service. Now, with Google, a lot of this comes down to the fact that they use SDN software-defined networking. So this allows, in this case, that Google can deploy a global IP and forward these roles anywhere in the Google network. Also, too, remember with load balancing and Google's network infrastructure that they own the infrastructure that you're traversing over Google's well-provisioned network. Now, there's three components, again, mainly um, global networking capabilities. Remember the infrastructure, software-defined networking, and then URL maps. And because it's a managed service, there's no like warm-up time, spin-up time, or anything that you might have to do. And never mind having to configure this um, on a per-VM basis as well. Now, Google supports different types of load balancing. Uh, network load balancing, HTTPS, cross-region content-based, and there is also a nice tool, uh, utility, um, more of a utility than a tool, but uh, it's called Cloud SSL Proxy. I'll talk about that. Now, what I'm going to do is talk just briefly about each of these because for the scope of this course, we just want to give you the options with load balancing, and then I'll talk about the best practices as well. Now, with network load balancing, it's important to realize that traffic can be distributed among multiple instances. It supports um, non-web-based protocols, basically TCP and UDP. Um, it does not support web HTTPS, so, so just realize that. Uh, this is also, again, um, a, a service that you want to um, look at carefully. Now, as far as network load balancing, again, um, it is going to allow you to select the region, the IP address, specific protocols, as well as part of the forwarding rules. And then, um, again, some other things that are listed there as well. But I did want to talk about HTTP load balancing a bit. And this is actually um, probably the more common uh, based uh, load balancing Google Cloud, mainly because a lot of web-based services. Now, with load balancing, you can distribute this traffic among instances based on the proximity to the user or to um, the URL or both. Now, as one of the best practices for um, Google Cloud and networking is we, of course, would want to determine our user base and ensure our traffic is going to the lowest latency um, 
region or zone that we can get it to. We can also attach auto scalers as well. And again, here are some features and functions. Now, one of the things to point out, again, we have the ability to set up load balancing um, with basically backend services uh, as well, and also a health check as you'll see in the demo. And I'll go through a lot of this in the demo. It's easier to show you than talk about it in a PowerPoint. Now, global forwarding. This is a rule that provides a single global anycast IP. This is actually really nice because you could basically flip a switch and route your traffic from one continent to another. Basically, um, the forwarding rule can only forward to a single port. And lastly, the forwarding rules can only be used by a HTTPS load balancer. Target proxies are going to be used to route that incoming traffic, essentially, based on the policy that you set, like the URL or the service configs. And again, some more information on what can be configured um, with this version of load balancing. Now, there's uh, one thing to point out, too. We have uh, typically what can happen is connection draining. This is where the instance um, will need to sort of flush itself out before it gets disconnected. In other words, you don't want to drop a session. And there is also a really nice utility called Cloud SSL Proxy. This is nice because customers can download this and install this on a virtual machine and basically not have to have the overhead with SSH, for example, or SSL, I should say, um, to basically um, route out to Google Cloud. And again, a lot of good benefits there uh, as well. And then cross-region load balancing, this allows us to use a single Anycast IP across cross-regions. We're going to route this basically to the closest region based on the user or the request. And then lastly, we have content-based load balancing. This is basically web traffic only. It's going to essentially um, route traffic based on the type of content for example, a video file could be handled differently than a Word document, whatever the situation is. For example, route it to the closest region or don't route it to the closest region. And we want to be able to configure different instance types as well for different content types. We have a lot of flexibility with this. Let's go over to the demo. I'll walk you through setting up load balancing and talking about some of the features and functions of it as well. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's go ahead and talk about load balancing and instance groups. Now, we know that an instance group is going to be deployed, especially if we're going to want to use auto scaling, load balancing for updates, etc. Before we deploy any load balancing, we want to go over to what is called the instance group um, section. And what we want to do here is go down over to where it says compute and there it is and then we want to go over to instance groups where you can see up here we have instance groups and instance group templates now i'm going to go ahead and select instance groups now you can see i pre-configured one already and it's basically auto scaling at 60 percent now if i go to templates just to show you i could go over here and if I want, I could select the template. I could create another template, create an instance group from this if I want. If I go here to create instance group, I'm going to call this um, basically GCP uh, network one, two, three. I could deploy this in a single zone or multiple zones. Whatever I feel like, I could select the region I want to deploy it in. I'm going to go US East 4. I'm going to go ahead and leave uh, this template uh, in this case. I want the minimum number of instances to be two. And you'll notice that I get this little warning. And it's just basically saying, 
um, pay attention. You don't want to deploy two instances in, for example, a region uh, that has, for example, three or four zones. So let's go ahead and see how many is actually in US East 4. So when I go to US East 4, I could see that there's three. Now I could also select where I want to deploy it. Uh, in this case, um, I'm just going to go ahead and make it easy and quick and minimize this. Again, they're just saying, hey, we recommend you do this. Um, in this case, for the demo, we're not going to worry about it. I just want to deploy it like that. Now, I could go ahead and deploy a health check. And if I select this, this is really cool, is this will bring me over to Stack Driver. For the purposes of this course, I'm going to skip out of that. What I want to do is just create that uh, new instance group. And then we want to talk about load balancing. Now, you can see the previous instance group, I had three, and I have an instance in three of three zones. You'll see that once this is done, it's going to say two out of three zones, and it just popped up, so that's great. You can see there I have auto scaling off versus on here. Um, again, just more of just a way to show you some of the possibilities of deploying templates. And there's certainly more we could configure with this and pay attention with. Now, finally, um, this is coming up. You can see that by default, it's saying 60%. This is now available. Okay, here's what we want to do now. We want to go ahead and uh, talk about a few other areas with instance groups and VMs. So I go back to the template. I still have the same template that I just used for the, for the two instance groups, essentially. What we want to do before I go to load balances, I want to talk about um, a couple areas here. The first thing is, if I want to go over here to network endpoint groups, this is actually a cool new feature. It, it's still in beta, but what this does is it's going to go ahead and collect a group of IPs. And basically, you're going to, uh, instead of like telling load balancing how to work, you're going to do the opposite. You're going to basically look at this as like a function instead of like a service. So this is actually sort of cool. And um, you go ahead in and deploy what's called an endpoint group. And this will basically um, apply these functions uh, like load balancing, firewall, logging, etc. Um, basically uh, on containers. And again, this is fairly new. So if I go here to select that, we want to go ahead and name this. I'm going to call this again uh, networking test or network test, whatever, close enough. Now, one thing to point out here is um, we want to pay attention to our VPC location. Now, we could select the default network. I'm going to go ahead and select the VPC test network that we deployed earlier in the class. I'm going to deploy this basically in networks in this project only. Now, if I went ahead and selected this, I would select a shared VPC network. In this case, I don't have any deployed, so it's not showing it. Let's go back and select this. What's also really nice is it gives me flexibility in letting me know what subnet I want to deploy in and what region as well. I could also select the default port. Um, as well, whatever you want to use. Uh, in this case, um, I'm just going to put 8080 for the fun of it. Now, what's really nice, um, again, if, if you're not familiar with this, Google gives you the REST equivalent, but also the CLI equivalent. If I select command line, I simply go ahead and run this in the cloud shell. I, I've done that a few times in the course already, but I just want to point it out because the best way to really learn this is to use the syntax, understand how it all works and goes together. Okay, so I go create. Now what this is going to do is, is start up and um, get this uh, endpoint group ready to go. Now we'll come back to this. This could take up to a minute uh, and actually just came back before I got done speaking. Now you can see when I select this, um, we need to add a network endpoint. So I go over here and I have to select an instance. Now to do this, I have to do a little bit more work. 
um, for example, what I have to do is add instances. And before I do that, I need to, of course, um, deploy uh, the container service with this. So again, this is just giving you some things we could do with this. All right, so let's go back to where we were and talk about the instance template and the instance group. And then over here, you could see that the instances um, that we deployed was essentially, um, I believe it was uh, right here, uh, network uh, one, two, three. So those are the ones we just deployed. What we want to do now is uh, go over here to network and go down to where load balancing would be. Now, before we um, go over here um, to network services, again, remember that the VPC is a virtual private uh, cloud, which is going to be essentially our sandbox in a sandbox. It gives us a lot of power, a lot of flexibility, and if you do take any Google exam, they really like talking about VPCs, but also how network peering and a shared VPC all come into play as well. All right, so let's go to network services and talk about load balancing. Now, we have to create a load balancer. What we want to do is create a load balancer. Now, remember, there's going to be some homework we want to do for time purposes and demo purposes, let's just go ahead and select the config for HTTPS. Um, in the uh, PowerPoint modules we went through with this, uh, we talked about the other options with TCP and UDP. Remember the uh, decision tree as well, and uh, the chart that I showed you to help determine where you want to go with load balancing. So let's go ahead and start configuration. All right, now what we want to do is of course plan before we deploy but this is again going to be a, a test I'm going to say test peer I select the backend config now what I want to do is select the backend bucket I'm going to go ahead and create a bucket and I believe I had a bucket deployed actually I think hold on one sec I got ahead of myself let's go ahead and browse buckets I did have a few here just to make it easy um, again, that's an app engine, but that's okay. I'm going to call this test and put it in that. You can see that I found it. Now, this is where when I deploy this bucket, I could enable cloud CDN. Remember when the CDN module, we said it was that simple. If we wanted to deploy CDN, we just simply click it. Go ahead and create. So now what I've done is create a backend bucket. And then um, over here is going to be the rules. So what I want to do is if I want, I could add a rule. I could select a backend bucket, test, and um, add as well, for example, my WordPress site uh, and uh, other services I might deploy. But in this case, I'm going to leave it as is. I'm going to go over here to review and finalize. Now over here, we could see that we have CDN enabled on that bucket. We have our rules set to the default. The front end is going to be in a firmware IP address for port 80. And you can notice here that we have, by default, the network tier. What we want to do is go create. This will bring up our load balancing service. Now, once this is up, we want to go ahead and edit some more rules like forwarding and stuff, maybe a proxy, whatever we're doing. We'll go ahead and come back to that in a few minutes when it's done. It may take up to a minute or two. Okay, so it is up. It took about a minute uh, or so. So what we want to do is now we want to look at some other features such as our IP address, we may want to know uh, the address, we may want to configure some other services. Before I do that, let's go in and look at it. And you can see that it has our IP port here. It has this set up in the front end. Remember, the front end is going to be what? This, the global IP that is going to essentially, or regional IP, uh, but in this case here, we have, um, 
this deployed as a regional service. So therefore, again, we want to just go ahead and uh, just realize that this is HTTP. And if we're, for example, accessing a website or WordPress site, we go ahead and have this load balanced as well between zones or regions, however we set this up. What's really nice is I can go ahead and set up my monitoring as well and see what's set up. Um, I go over here and go to caching. Now again, there isn't much going on because we just set it up, but let's go over here first before we continue on and look at the advanced menu. So the advanced menu actually provides our forwarding rules. For example, you could see that it has this web address. This would be the address that we would go to. Um, again, this is uh, not fully set up, so we're not going to see it totally work yet. But the protocol is TCP. And then this is the target. And you can see that this is um, the, the URL map right there. And then let's go back and talk about the target proxy. Uh, that's been set up as well. The backend service member is um, going to be a service. For example, um, we created a backend bucket, but we didn't create a service yet. So for example, a backend service, what we want to do is go over here. Let's say, for example, here, I'm going to call this um, oh, snapshot one, let's say. I'm going to go ahead and select the instance group. And then the port number, and I could do the load balancing based on utilization or rate, maximum CPU utilization. So for example, if the CPUs of these VMs get over 80%, then we need to kick in our load balancing. Now over here, we have our maximum RPS. This is again, a request per second. Uh, and uh, we could also select this per instance or per the group. Capacity is 100%. Um, we could get that down 80%. It depends on what we're doing. And once again, you can see we can enable Cloud CDN. Now, if I scroll up a little bit, we could set up a health check. We could also set up our advanced programming capabilities. And then we could go ahead and set that up as well. Now, the back end type, I'm going to go ahead and scroll this up a little bit so we could see that better down the bottom. And um, I think that might be OK there. Now, what we want to do is a um, couple of things. Again, there's so much to talk about, so much to do. But I just want to pay, pay attention to this, is when we select our mode, if we select rate, this is going to be a rate per second. Now, utilization, how is that, again, going to be um, utilized from a measuring perspective? It's going to be the CPU utilization. However, if I want to combine the CPU utilization and the RPS, I can do that. So again, it's up to me. But if I go with the rate only, um, again, you could see that that's uh, there. And it gives me the option as well as based on the capacity. So I have a few different options on how I want to approach this. And then I can enable CDN, right? So let's go ahead and go done. And if I go up here, it tells me the back end is listed here. I could add another back end. Go over here to advanced configs. And this is where I want to set up, for example, little facets like session affinity. Basically, what happens if I have to terminate or I can't connect in time um, to the load balancing service? Also, too, I may need to have a cookie, especially if I'm using HTTP, right? Timeout, customer headers, security policy we get set up. Um, now, again, you notice that it says if you want to use a policy, disable CDN. Once again, this is another little detail you got to pay attention to. Let's go create. Um, oh, I needed to actually um, create a health check in this case. And again, um, I think I had one set up earlier, but let's go ahead and select the proxy protocol. I'm going to leave it as none. And I'm going to save and continue. And then I go create. All right. So now I got my back end services set up. And if I go to buckets, that's ready to go. 
Now, what about certificates? Chances are, if you're running web protocol, you want to go ahead and run, um, you know, secure socket for your app, then uh, again, we need to do what? Uh, we need to go in and um, add certificates, right? And then target pools. We can then go over here, add a target pool. Now, a target pool is what? This is going to, again, going to give us uh, a place to um, utilize, uh, for example. Uh, now, remember, we have um, some terms here. Um, around like low distribution. So for example, if we have incoming traffic, we want to divert it from the primary um, target to another target. We want to create a target pool. Basically, it's going to go ahead and direct our incoming traffic uh, to what is called a target pool. Okay. Okay, well, let's go back to network services. And um, you can see that we have our test peer up, the protocol, uh, our bucket is uh, valid. Check our back end. You can see that the back end bucket, again, uh, looks like it's shown up as a test peer. And then the front end has been set up as well. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next module. All right, well, let's talk about two services under security and what you want to know about these services. First off, we have security um, over here. Um, this is actually a little different section. What we want to do is actually go down to network and go over to network security and talk about Cloud Armor and SSL policies. So let's select network security. And then what we want to do is um, basically talk about it before we do anything. Now, this is a uh, approach to security policies that we could deploy at your network edge. For example, Cloud Armor is going to help protect any load balance services. And the goal is to provide a policy that is going to make up rules and prohibit or allow traffic from a specific IP address range or ranges. Basically, it's sort of like another layer to a firewall, but at the edge. Now, the firewall protects basically inside of Google Cloud, but it doesn't protect outside of Google Cloud at the edge. So we want to think about it as another layer that we could add on to security. Basically, when we implement edge security, we could do this with either deny or allow lists. And that's exactly what it's doing. Basically, it's going to allow you to restrict or allow traffic to your load balancer. Now, it's only going to work for HTTPS load balancer. So just be aware. And it allows us to basically deploy this at the edge and not worry about, for example, resources being over consumed and having malicious users consume basically a lot of overhead, for example. So that's really what this does. And if we wanted to, we just go here to create a policy. And um, again, we call this whatever we want. We could uh, go ahead and cr create what's called an allow action or a deny action. And we could also set the status uh, as well. So if we say deny, just say bad gateway, this is actually sort of nice because it's like sort of telling um, the rogue actor or just someone playing around that, you know, maybe this isn't where you want to go. Uh, and uh, again, it's sort of a nice approach. Very simple and straightforward. Oh, we could say allow. And then I go next step. I could add a rule. Now I could go ahead and go next step again. I could add policies. And again, in this case, it's very simple. I have basically allow pretty much, um, you know, all IP addresses, which is not what you want to do. But anyways, this is just, again, just to show you how this could work. And so the policy is being created. And, and then because I'm running load balancing, uh, this is going to, again, um, allow me to tie this into my web based load balancers. Remember too, in Google Cloud, all load balancing is a managed service. 
Now, the other service I want to talk about as well is called SSL policies. Again, um, this allows us to manage our traffic um, with our clients that are using HTTPS or SSL. And again, another service that is available for you to set up. So what you would do is you set up different profiles and then save those profiles. And then your users would use one of these profiles uh, that you set them up with to access Google Cloud. This sort of acts uh, very similar to like Concentrator and also essentially uh, acts as uh, basically a front end to your load balancer as well. And these policies I'm going to create are going to be, of course, TLS based. And this is, of course, not anything new. This is, you know, again, the proper protocol. This is basically the most secure way that's generally accepted. Uh, and it's been in use, of course, uh, for about 20 years. Now, one of the things to point out, too, um, is that uh, with uh, TLS capabilities, you can also um, consider how you manage your policies uh, as well. So the first thing is, is the features, for example, you create um, different profiles such as um, compatible, restricted, customized, whatever, uh, and then select, for example, the TLS version that you want to deploy and then a profile to go with it. So for example, compatible, modern, restricted, and custom. So these are the default ones that are set. And then we could apply this to specific load balancing resources, which is actually sort of nice. So for example, if you have load balancers in Europe and load balancing um, running in the US, you may want to have separate policies just because of the compliance requirements. Again, there's many other things to consider, but that's just one thing to consider in this case, right? Now, also two um, types of users, locations, geographically, application types, whatever you need to create a separate policy for, uh, it'll go ahead and support you with, right? So it's fairly simple to do that. So if you go over here, I'm gonna go ahead and just call this Pearson Test. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, select compatible. In this case, this is probably the easiest to set up, less work and less things to worry about. And this will go ahead and deploy this um, compatible default, um, very similar to the default um, policy. So again, that's just one way. And then I go up here, I create another one. Let's say I want 1.2. And then um, instead of compatible, I want to have more restrictive use cases. Some of these features will be disabled while others are enabled. And then um, I do actually have to uh, name it. So I'll just go ahead and leave it like that. And you can see that I have another policy that's a different version of TLS and is more restricted. And again, this is going to tie into our web um, based protocol load balancers. Let's go ahead and move on to the next subject. Let's talk about firewall rules. Now in Google Cloud, a couple little factoids to talk about. First of all, GCP uses software-defined networking, and therefore you're using SDN rules, not hardware device rules or anything. Second of all, firewall rules are stateful. In other words, it's depending on the state, so we have to pay attention to our rules. With that said, let's go ahead and talk about how to get there. Now, what we want to do is go down to networking, and it's right there in front of me. And you can see that we have our VPC networks there, and then we have firewall rules. Now, the firewall rules will come up, and you'll see that we have firewall rules already created for the WordPress apps, for example. And we have, in this case, also for some VMs, RDP and SSH configured. Now, what I could do is create a firewall rule for incoming or outgoing traffic, of course, and determine how to um, allow traffic in or allow traffic out. Now, there's a lot of terms with firewalls uh, in Google 
So let's just talk about some of this before we um, move on. The first thing is we have basically logs. Now, uh, basically, we're going to put in a name. I'll put in Pearson Test 1, 2. And then logs. So first of all, do we want to enable logging on the firewall? Chances are you probably do, so we want to select that on. And then we want to select the network that we want to, to utilize. Now the priority. Now the priority of a firewall is exactly what you've been used to in other firewalls generally. It's a priority that's applied to the network. So basically the lowest number gets the highest priority and it starts from 1,000. Now in a lot of cases you may want to keep, for example, services such as web traffic with the lower priority than other traffic such as a uh, end of the month query that isn't super important to maybe, you know, 2,000 or higher, whatever. But you have 0 to 65,000 535 as the priority level. Now, what about direction of traffic? This is basically going to be the flow type. Is it ingress or, or outgress or egress, really? Uh, so it's ingress or egress. Now, again, ingress is what? That's coming into Google Cloud. And then egress is what? Going out of Google Cloud. Then action on match. This is basically saying a couple things. Basically, do we want to um, allow or deny the traffic? If we have, for example, port, um, let's say, 8080, do we want to deny that traffic on match or do we want to allow it? Pretty simple, but the way it's worded can be confusing to some folks because it seems a little backwards, right? What about targets? So targets is basically where you want to apply the rules. Basically, how do you apply the rules to what instances and any tags that you want to apply? So for example, um, I could go ahead and say all the instances in this network or a specific target tag. For example, um, I could go ahead and say anything with, uh, you know, test in it, whatever or anything with prod or production. You know, generally as a best practice, you want to tag your VMs so you can monitor to them, audit them effectively, uh, and then also kick off services such as uh, the firewall as well. Now we want to put in our ranges if that's the case. Now let's see here. Protocols and ports. So what does that mean? Well, basically, again, if we're going to allow TCP, UDP, whatever service, so if we want to, like, allow, um, you know, 443, whatever, port 8080, whatever protocol we want to allow, go ahead and select that. We then go over here and disable a rule um, on certain targets, so we go ahead and disable or enable. And again, we have some um, other things to think about as well, but generally that's where you want to get started. Now, one of the things too, um, you could have multiple ports in a single rule. So if I wanted to, you could select that or select another protocol. You know, again, they have examples like uh, SCTP or FTP. You could put in whatever protocol you want. Now, what we want to do before we move on is just double check a few things here. Okay, so I have that network set up and I could put in IP filters as well. So again, um, the source IP range, for example, is going to be an IP range that we're going to filter. And this is the default essentially that you're going to provide with the range of IPs that are going to be permitted. So if you have a specific CEDAR range you want to monitor, add that in, a subnet, whatever, feel free to do that. Now, again, I got to put in that range. So, for example, um, I'm going to put in, uh, let's see, I don't know my IP range on top of my head here. But I'm just going to put this in for fun. Again, probably not, uh, you know, again, what you'd normally do. But I'm just going to put that in because, again, I don't have my IP memorized. and it, doesn't matter for this demo. 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create the firewall rule. So you can see there that I have my um, ranges here. I have my filter, in this case here, to 10.128.00. And then the IP range you can see is open over here. Now you see the protocols that are set up here um, as well. And again, um, this is the uh, one we just created, Pearson Test 1, TCP 443, UDP. Uh, default is 1,000, and then you can see this, apply to all, 65, 5, 3, 4. So some of these are default rules that are set. Some of them are not. So that's basically what you would do to create a firewall rule. Fairly straightforward, not a lot to it. And again, this is done on what? The firewall uh, rules are set where? Typically on the VPC network. So I could go over here, for example, create my VPC. Also to remember when we create the uh, firewall rule, um, again, we have some options, right? If I want, I could go over here, create them as well. And then when I deploy, for example, um, service, I could also configure them as well. So I have uh, some really cool options with rolling out a firewall rule. Let's talk about cloud CDN. Basically, this is content delivery networking. Now, what is really nice about cloud CDN is it's actually quite effective cost-wise, but from a performance perspective, it's actually really competitive, if not more competitive than other providers. And I'll explain why. Now, when it comes to CDN, it leverages Google's distributed edge cache. This enables you to essentially serve content at the edge, which is, again, what you'd want. However, one of the things that makes it really easy is that it has lower latency, of course, but you enable this with the checkbox. So the latency is going to be pretty low in a lot of cases, and there's been a study that was actually just released by a company called Sedexis that named Google CDN number one in the business. So that's really pretty impressive. But another reason, um, and I'm going to go ahead and spell it out now, I was going to wait, but basically with cloud CDN as compared to other competitors, CDN's typically been used as more of a static content perspective uh, or approach, whereas in cloud CDN and Google, it actually serves dynamic information as well. And I'll explain the services that are supported here in a minute. So that's also really one of the great benefits as, uh, as well with this. And the features, again, are built in into Google Cloud, so you just go ahead and check a box and you're good to go. Another thing to think about, too, is if, if you're using, for example, Cloud Storage and App Engine, um, these are just some of the services that are enabled, um, you don't really need to look at other CDM products because these services are typically deployed at the edge already. And that is a big deal as well to consider. And it also works with load balancing as well, provides bucket mapping uh, as well, and also supports custom domains. Now, a couple other things to point out is it also does support any cast. So what that means is you go ahead and serve your content from a single IP um, that is going to have low latency in the first place from any, any place in the world. Another thing, too, it does support HTTPS, HTTP version 2 as well. Integrates with Stackdriver, allows you to invalidate content on the fly. So, for example, if you want to take down any cached content and, and have it removed immediately, it supports that. And as far as uh, being able to serve content dynamically, again, it's going to cache um, cloud storage, for example, on the edge. And again, it, it's got more of a dynamic approach than a static approach, which is actually really nice. Okay, so again, a lot more to talk about here. Now, what about peering, for example? When we're considering CDN, um, you may want to peer directly to your resources in the cloud and even perhaps um, a CDN provider uh, as well. It could be 
again, you may want to have some of your content on one provider and another on Google Cloud. Whatever makes sense, this can be integrated. Now, Google provides CDN pairing for several other providers, uh, for example, but also when we compare it to like Amazon, they only provide pairing for their own service only, and that is Amazon CloudFront. Now, and one more thing that I want to point out is we could also consider CDN Interconnect, which is a way to leverage essentially direct connectivity to a CDN provider. So for example, CDN Interconnect allows you to connect to your provider with direct peering links to Google's Edge network. As part of this, you're going to be essentially providing traffic, of course, that is going to come from Google Cloud Platform and will link to a direct connection, essentially, to your CDM provider. Now, if you want to find out more about the CDM provider, let's go take a look. And here is the link uh, for the providers that are supported. So you don't have to just use Google Cloud CDN if you just want to use Akamai. And, and again, these are providers for example, like Akamai and Cloudflare, these are very common, popular providers. Maybe you just want to use Google Cloud and extend um, your CDN to GCP without having to flop everything over to Google Cloud CDN. So Google provides that advantage that Amazon just doesn't provide right now. And these are the providers that are supported at this time. With that said, um, Cloud CDN Interconnect is a great uh, solution, can meet, a course, the right use case. It will definitely make sense. With that said, let's go ahead and move on. A lot more to talk about. Now, in Google Cloud, we have what's called an instance group. And this is simply a collection of virtual machine instances that we want to manage essentially as a single entity of like-minded VMs. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the reasons that we may want to do this. Basically, we generally want to manage our VMs, generally for high availability purposes, for scalability, for updates, for example. And if that's the case, then Again, the simplest way to take 20 VMs or 100 is to group them together in an instance group. And that's done via an, uh, basically what's called an instance template and just put it all together. So if we have a machine image and that machine image is going to have, you know, a couple vCPUs with so much memory and a config that we want to deploy with scripts, let's say, we can go ahead and do that very easily with an instance group and manage it just as one. Now there's also what's called an unmanaged instance group and you could still manage instances that are not similar and that's via an unmanaged instance group. Now generally an unmanaged instance group will allow you to load balance across that uh, group of virtual machines but you really can't uh, go ahead out and uh, be able to um, manage this effectively if, uh, for example, you want to um, load balance uh, and, and auto scale at the same time. But anyways, with that said, um, it's really uh, up to you to decide what makes sense in your organization. But generally, I would see an unmanaged instance group be created, for example, with uh, virtual machines that are for a specific application. But one might be for the search capability. Another might be for data collection or data dumping. And they're running two different machine images for whatever purpose. But uh, with that said, that's another use case in itself. So what I want to really get to the point here around the networking part of this is if we're going to use load balancing, we need to set up an instance group that is managed. Because this group is managed, we want to be able to serve our workloads 
and forward these workloads to the appropriate um, basically uh, location workload that's going to handle it but basically we want to be able to create a managed instance group and ensure that we're providing a suitable workload um, that is going to be able to perform to manage the throughput that's required essentially and to do that we have to go ahead and create an, a managed instance group and we want to create that via a template in the demo we'll go through all this but basically again it's very simple there's benefits to creating this instance group um, and there's different uh, types of them as well we have of course zonal and regional uh, as well so uh, again if we take a zonal uh, what does that mean basically this instance group is only going to be able to um, scale to a zonal perspective if we want to scale regionally, then we need to select a regional approach. We'll talk more about this in the demo, so let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about Cloud DNS. Now, Cloud DNS is a managed service. It is meant to be resilient, reliable, low latency, basically. And this is a DNS service that Google uses as well. So this is again a service that is backed up by literally 100% availability. So, the, so to get started, what you want to do is create what's called a zone, which is essentially a namespace, uh, what your domain is going to be, essentially what you're going to use for DNS. You would then basically configure this, enter your record information, and then create that. And then as well, there's also policies that you configure um, as well um, as part of your zone. So Cloud DNS, a nice tool again, it scales automatically. Um, you have a authoritative uh, DNS lookup, you have Anycast name services. You also have the ability to manage through an API, DNS peering, also it will be logged. And then um, the other service I want to talk about is Cloud NAT. We covered the rest in other modules. But basically, Cloud NAT is, is nice because, let's say, for example, you want to deploy your um, Compute Engine instances or Kube Engine instances, or containers, I should say. And you don't want to expose your uh, IP addresses to the internet. And so create what's called a NAT gateway and Cloud NAT is that service. And it'll deploy this with Cloud Router as well as part of this configuration. So you select basically a gateway name for it. You select the router that you want to use, select the region, and then any other information for mapping that you want to use. So fairly straightforward, nothing particularly difficult here to set up, to be honest. Um, Again, if you're going to set up a router, what you want to do is um, I'm going to just call this just some default name. I'm going to go hello. And then um, I'm going to use a default um, region and I, IP range that's already been set up. Then as far as mapping, again, I have some choices to make as well. Um, once again, I'll leave it up to you to investigate if this is of interest to you. And then I just simply create the cloud NAT gateway. Now, what happens after this? Um, basically, there's a few things that we would want to do. Now, some of the things we'd want to do, of course, is to plan out our compute engine or Kubernetes engine strategy, determine our IAM structure that we would need, determine our subnets and, and all that. But let's go ahead and take a look at the the very simple gateway we created right here. And you can see that it basically um, is US East 1 only. It is essentially auto allocating IPs. Uh, basically, it gives me some of the stats here. But if I want to edit it, I would go over here and select edit. But I could also specify down here other things such as stack driver logging. I could also specify and change the number of VMs, essentially, with, with ports, the minimum number of ports per VM. Also adjust some of the protocols that could be used as well, uh, if I wanted to as well. 
Now, I also have logs over here. I could go to stack driver logging. And of course, there's not going to be anything really there because we just sort of got going. But basically, um, that is Cloud NAT. Now, there's a lot of good um, reasons to use Cloud NAT, Cloud DNS uh, as well. But as far as use cases um, with Cloud NAT, uh, we could use it, for example, with the shared VPC if we want. This allows us to have uh, multiple projects in an organization to use essentially a shared network. And as part of the use case, we could have that Cloud NAT gateway basically be used to host uh, the project resources in this shared network. And to do that, we would simply, of course, set up our networking information to accomplish that. All right, so with that said, um, let's go ahead and move on to the next subject. Let's talk about hybrid connectivity. Basically, hybrid connectivity is going to be you as an organization choosing a way to connect to Google Cloud. And there's different approaches to that. A lot of it depends on your budget, but also the SLA that you need. Also, security perspectives such as do you want to go ahead and use your own VPN or do you not? Do you want to use a managed service like Cloud VPN, etc.? So let's talk about the options in Google Cloud. The first option and the most cost prohibitive is going to be Cloud Interconnect. Now, Cloud Interconnect is going to be a service that you would want to use if you need to have the highest SLA available with Google Cloud. Now, Cloud Interconnect is, of course, similar to Direct Connect for those folks that know AWS. Then that will give you a great idea of what this is going to do. But basically, you're going to extend your data center to your Google Cloud projects. You have the ability to use an IPsec VPN. It's direct access into your virtual private cloud and your projects. And there is an SLA as part of this service. And for those that uh, do not have Cloud Interconnect available in your locations, your cities, your countries, etc., then Partner Interconnect is another option that could be used uh, as well. Now, why would we want to use this service? Because of the fact that Google offers you connections, essentially up to 10 gigabits per second, uh, for a maximum of 80 megabits per second. So that's a pretty good connection speed. And then if you're using partner interconnect, you have increments of typically about 50 meg uh, to start with. And you could scale that up uh, as well as needed. Now, the one thing I will say is that partner interconnect has more flexibility to it um, than Google Cloud interconnect. Uh, just because of the connection strategy that's used. So if you don't need to have uh, basically large connections, then maybe uh, Cloud Interconnect may not be the best choice from a budget perspective, and you just go with Partner Interconnect. For example, with dedicated Interconnect, known as Cloud Interconnect as well, you're going to have the high bandwidth uh, and the, the main thing to point out, too, is that the connection minimal uh, required is going to be 10 gigs, whereas with Partner Interconnect, it's 50 megabits uh, per second. So it's somewhat uh, smaller and more flexible. So that's one thing to think about as well. Now, another thing to point out as well is your routing configuration. So you have to use BGP. And you need to have routers that are going to support this or use Cloud Router as well. It's generally both, to be honest. And then the SLA, though, that Google will provide you is, of course, going to be an end-to-end -end SLA. Now, you could also use uh, Partner Interconnect. They do provide an SLA, but that varies uh, by the provider available. And then the pricing um, between the two is going to vary uh, as well with Google uh, dedicated interconnect, um, it's a little bit uh, what I would call less flexible. 
you're going to have minimum fees. Uh, you're going to have to pay for a circuit uh, as well uh, at a minimal amount. I think it's uh, basically uh, around 2000 a month uh, is the numbers I saw uh, for one 10 gigabits uh, circuit. And then there's other fees involved as well, such as your egress traffic and then any number of VLANs that you might use as well. So this is a great service. I just recommend it to look into it more. But again, it's all about the use case. Now peering. Now peering is a great strategy to use as well in the right situations. This is where you can go ahead and connect your virtual private clouds um, together or connect with another uh, partner company or a consortium member, whatever the situation is. Uh, as well. So this is uh, peering. The, the main reason to use peering though uh, comes down to two use cases. Basically if you want to have several admin domains, for example, had a customer that bought another Google Cloud customer and they want to be able to, of course, manage each other effectively, bring in the organization, uh, but also have that separation as well and peering can provide that. Now, organizations that also want to peer with other organizations as well, whatever um, the use case is for that, again, uh, gives you some flexibility. Now, with uh, network peering, again, it gives you some advantages uh, as well. Could be network latency is reduced, security could be enhanced, and also could reduce some your costs as well. So definitely look at uh, the link there if you want more information. Uh, as well on VPC peering. And then over here is an example of how peering could work. We have our two projects, uh, for example, here connecting from project three to project two. And then we have another project one and then project four. Um, again, I'm not sure how they ordered that, but again, that's just a good example that uh, Google uh, has provided. And what's nice about this is that it allows you to extend your environments and manage how these connections are going to um, integrate uh, as well. So you may want to have your developers in one project and then another project, your pro production or test or whatever other resources are available. Another thing too is a lot of companies, of course, are multinational and each of these countries that they're in are going to have different compliance requirements and therefore you need to consider your compliance strategy as well when it comes to peering but also just deployment in general. Now peering works with compute engine, app engine, flexible environment does not work with standard because standard is a sandbox a little bit different and then Google um, Kubernetes engine as well GKE. Now, some of the properties, uh, just to make a note of, that I, I thought was uh, worth talking about. The first is, is that the VPC networks will be administratively separate, and therefore you're still going to manage them separately, but you're basically bringing them together from a connection standpoint. So it's up to you to manage the routes on both ends, your VPN connections, uh, your seed arranges, etc., appropriately. Now to set up peering is pretty straightforward in the console. You're going to go uh, left to right and then right to left essentially. Basically connect up one side, then you connect up the other side. And then we have another concept called a shared VPC. And this is a little different than uh, VPC peering. But basically network peering is going to allow you to peer with a shared VPC as well. And this is where you can have your projects um, that are going to be, uh, for example, uh, in a different project and you want to connect them up, but you don't want to peer the whole project, for example, um, or the whole network for that matter together. So this is a great example of how you could share, for example, a project to another project and uh, just use one network, for example, and not every other network that's part of the organization or in that VPC. And when it comes to sharing a VPC, a lot of it does come down to the use case. So don't just share a VPC because you can. It's more about does it really need to be shared or not? 
do these projects really need to communicate with each other or not? So for example, another reason to use a shared VPC I see quite a bit is for uh, example, production wanting to work with development and QA, and they wanna give them access to roll out, for example, a CI pipeline uh, that is going to effectively roll out software, uh, for example, uh, and, and actually make it uh, facilitate essentially through what is called continuous deployment. So this allows automation to push out basically um, a containerized update to one project and then once it goes through that phase it gets to another project so basically we go from dev to QA to test for example vice versa whatever uh, it's set up as and then over to production finally is the last stage so that's another use case that I would see typically as well all right so let's go ahead and move on um, I did also talk uh, in separate uh, module that is about cloud VPN, that's another form of hybrid connectivity uh, as well, but that was covered separately, so feel free to go back to uh, that module if you're still looking for more information. Um, I am now gonna go ahead and move on to the next module. Let's talk about cloud VPN. So cloud VPN, of course, uh, is a virtual private network and Cloud VPN is Google's take on basically a managed virtual private network. Now, Cloud VPN as a managed service supports only IPsec gateway to gateway scenarios. Now, what this means, if you're gonna connect on-prem basically to Google Cloud, you need to, of course, ensure that you have a gateway set up and it does support um, a myriad of different options on how to connect uh, to the Google uh, VPN gateway. Basically, this is going to allow you to connect your on-prem to Google Cloud, and it's going to use IPsec VPN connection. Now, when it comes to Cloud VPN, it's going to, of course, connect your peer network to GCP. And it's going to use IPsec. With that said, the traffic that's going to go through, for example, the networks is going to be encrypted by one gateway and decrypted by the other. For example, on-prem will encrypt it and then Google Cloud will decrypt it. This is going to protect your data and provide some benefits around that, of course. Now, when you're trying to determine like an interconnect type, we wanna be aware that there's different options. So Cloud VPN is a good option for the right situation. Now there's Cloud Interconnect, Partner Interconnect, and you really can't mix these together. So there's a whole use case to discuss between the two. Now, GCP does offer um, two types of cloud VPN services, essentially. And uh, these cloud services are going to provide different types of VPN gateways. Basically, we have high availability and we have the classic VPN. Now, the VPN features that are supported are listed here. I won't go ahead and read them all to you, but I did want to point out just a few things. If we do, for example, um, choose the HA version, this is going to allow us to have a highly available solution that we can connect on-prem to GCP. And it'll, of course, still use IPsec VPN. And it's going to provide 99.99% availability. So pretty much uh, as close as you're going to get to 100% especially in a cloud provider, that's pretty unusual. Now, when it comes to a lot of the requirements um, for time purposes and for the, the course itself, your best bet is to get into the Google documentation and discuss the different uh, scenarios between you and your team members. Now, when it comes to connecting your enterprise to GCP, some notes here that you'll want to be aware of for example, it's going to support RSC 1918 addressing. It's going to have a separate instance of cloud router, 
uh, as well if you're going to deploy this in different regions for example one in Iowa one in Finland wherever your services are located now the tunnel um, properties are three gigabits and you can have multiple tunnels and also note that you can of course use third-party devices for support you would of course need to validate that against what is supported and what is not now the peer VPN gateway uh, again is going to be your on-prem uh, and it can also be another VPN service for example open VPN is actually a great solution that can be used uh, as well and it's not a gateway to gateway solution it's it's a different approach so you could have peers connect for example and that's pretty common to see as well also note too um, when we talk about for example key exchange ike um, and i don't have it listed here is a supported um, key exchange that's used essentially for authentication and it negotiates between um, the two gateways as far as routing is concerned uh, just be aware that the tunnel requires the addition of static routes and if you do um, add static routes you need to restart the VPN when it comes to the deployment of the service uh, in the demo you'll see this a little bit you know easier of course but basically we have a global and regional um, capability we just want to be aware of that uh, if you do take any of the exams whether it's a networking one or the architect for example and cloud engineer um, generally they like to talk about the bandwidth the throughput I should say and then as far as how to scale horizontally it's generally through parallel tunnels now the VPN tunnel uh, for those that may not be familiar with that it's basically going to be a tunnel that connects the two gateways it's going to serve essentially as a median for that encrypted traffic to pass through you need to have two VPN tunnels essentially to create a connection so just be aware of that now each tunnel will define the connection from the perspective of its gateway basically again a cloud VPN tunnel is always associated with a specific VPN gateway resource when we talk about a connection for example think about this as a logical link between cloud VPN and the peer VPN which may be on-prem now when it comes to the VPC and VPNs we want to of course pay attention to how we deploy our VPNs and how we deploy them as well of course in the virtual private cloud that we are going to be using now lastly when it comes to uh, for example protocols like border gateway protocol this is typically a gateway routing protocol uh, that's pretty standard it's RSC 1722 allows us basically for example our devices if they're BGB capable can perform routing and this allows us to enable BGP protocol and also assign an IP address with what's called an autonomous system number and this is again um, can be something to consider as well now lastly I think the last thing I want to talk about before we get on into the rest of the content and the demo is when it comes to our VPC and VPN that we're going to be connecting our managed cloud VPN services to a VPC uh, lastly one more note too that we want to consider um, with cloud VPN for example if we have sensitive information that that's a good use case for cloud VPN uh, that's at the application level um, perhaps um, we could use cloud VPN but we could also you know use uh, what's called partner interconnect or dedicated interconnect and there is of course a use case for that as well and there's a decision tree under networking products that I'd recommend you take a quick look at to understand the scenario for using cloud VPN over partner interconnect or dedicated interconnect 
Um, you can't use Cloud VPN with dedicated interconnect because it sort of defeats the purpose. Dedicated interconnect we'll talk about coming up next, uh, basically um, after the next demo. But just realize that that use case is really, of course, uh, a dedicated pipe that's going to provide you the ability to connect directly at Google's POP connection and give you the lowest latency, most private connection you're going to get. So let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about networking tiers in Google Cloud. Now, Google has two networking tiers. One is known as standard and the other is premium. Now, premium is somewhat new at the time of writing, probably about a year old. But with that said, there's two versions of basically networking tiers. We have standard and premium. So let's talk about the difference. Now, premium is going to be high performance as compared to standard. And in reality, the main thing to think about is, do you need to have that redundancy for your load balancing, which is in, in most cases, uh, if it's a distributed service, will likely want to be a load balance service that is going to be a global service. And therefore, it provides you a high performance, low latency, global service level agreement. On the other hand, if we're not using, for example, a use case that requires performance, the best reliability, and a global footprint, then standard is just fine. Standard is going to give you that trade-off between performance and cost. So let's just take a quick look at this link right here and talk about what is the real difference. Now, on the Network Tiers page, there's um, a nice little graphic that I like that goes between premium and standard. And when you click, it really sort of sums it all up nicely. Basically, premium tier is going directly over Google's network. It essentially allows you to reduce the number of hops, allows you to get the best performance, and you're also provided a several level agreement. If you're going to use global load balancing, you want to use premium tier. It's going to provide benefits to your enterprise, to your customers, whatever the situation is. And it also provides you as well a footprint that is certainly larger than any Google uh, competitor, at least from my knowledge. Now, we go to standard tier. You can see that you have your standard routing. And that may be just fine. You can see that the number of hops will be higher. You're going to exit Google Cloud. Uh, and with that said, it's really more of a trade-off. Do you want to have better performance and an SLA, or do you not want to have a global SLA, and do you care about a lower cost or higher cost? Again, it's all about a trade-off in this case. Now, if you go down to the two different uh, diagrams they have here, this gives you a use case. For example, if you're using global cloud load balancing, you're going to get an Anycast IPv4 or v6 IP address. And this allows you to enable your premium applications to scale out to a global level. Now, when we consider the standard here, we just want to be aware that this is perfectly fine if performance is not your highest priority. Again, there's no global SLA, and it is a trade-off. So choose wisely when you're designing your network services on Google Cloud. With that said, I encourage you to check out the Network Tiers site. This has a ton of different resources and links to look at. And they also have this really cool decision tree that really should enable you to decide, 
do we need to enable network tiers or do we not? Lastly, this gives you that comparison between what is supported and what is not. Now, if you want to use Cloud CDN, you need to, of course, enable premium tier. Once again, is load balancing going to scale globally or is it going to be regionally? Once again, it's all down to your use case. So let's go ahead and proceed on. When it comes to best practices for Google Cloud, this web page is where you want to go to get started on understanding the best practices for whatever you're looking at. Whether it's networking, storage, security, in Google Cloud, this is where you start at. It is called the best practices for enterprise organizations. Now I want to point out the networking part of this. I'd like you to go ahead and take a look and scroll on down. Now you can see this is identity and access management. Uh, and then of course we went through the organization setup. And then if we keep on scrolling down, we want to get over here to the networking and security section. And this walks you through best practices for defining a virtual private cloud, managing your firewall traffic, connecting your enterprise to Google Cloud, for example, securing your apps as well. So for example, if we go to manage traffic with firewall rules, this tells you, again, Google's approach to what you want to consider with your firewall rules, such as, uh, identifying your tags, your subnets, basically um, understanding how it all works, uh, how to limit access, etc. as well. So with that said, this is again a very important document to look at uh, as well. Uh, connect your enterprise network. This goes through, you know, why you may want to choose uh, Cloud Interconnect or why you may want to choose Cloud VPN. This is the starting point for anyone learning Google Cloud. Uh, but with that said, definitely take a second to look at it and understand their best practices. And if you ever take a Google Cloud exam, well, guess what? This is where a lot of the content will come from, from a question perspective uh, or even the objectives for the exam. So go on over to the documentation site and go to best practices for enterprise organizations. Just go ahead and put in best practices for enterprises, uh, GCP, and this will bring you right to their page. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next module. Now, one of the tasks that we want to do, of course, when we set up our network and our VPCs and all our services is to ensure that we have flow logs. Now the VPC flow logs are going to record basically network flows that are sent and received by the VM instances. These are going to be very important for management, monitoring, forensics, um, optimization, etc. So what we want to do is go down to network here and go to VPC. And let's uh, select the default in this case. Now you can see over here that uh, we have flow logs. What we want to do is select flow logs and then go ahead and view the flow logs of all subnets in this case. Now I could go over here as well and select two. And then you could see that I can configure and only view like the logs of selected subnets. So it gives me some flexibility there. In this case here, let's just go ahead and view um, that subnet in this case. Now the flow logs, we can enable or disable per subnet. We also um, can enable them uh, as well uh, for pretty much the whole VPC or just a few subnets, whatever we want. But basically, the flow logs are built in natively. And so it's part of the stack. So there's very little work for us to get it running, and it's all built in. So there's no real performance penalty either. Now, you can see that there's no entries um, really here, except for um, there's um, this here uh, listed, log name. That's about it. 
So basically, if we go um, back to the VPC network, we go ahead and uncheck that. And then let's just see what we get by looking at all the subnets. Now, you can see that uh, there is uh, some um, traffic uh, listed here, but not in the last hour. Uh, again, last 24 hours, not much. And then no limit. And you can see that that's going to take a second or two to come back. It's scanning now. And what this will do is it'll come back if it does find any kind of um, entries um, that uh, match. You can see that um, what we want to do in this case is let's say create a metric. And this metric we want to uh, basically um, define in a manner that allows us to identify what we're looking for. So let's say VPC errors or something, you know, whatever that is, right? And I'll just say error, uh, error one, again, just for test purposes. Then I could select units and then the type of counter. And then I could say, for example, a unit of, um, uh, you know, latency, like microseconds, milliseconds, whatever I want to do. I go ahead and create that. Um, again, just for test purposes, you could see these are the system metrics, but we could also create basically what's called a user defined metric. So from a system metric perspective, this is what would be available. And again, if we want to go ahead and create an additional user defined, we could do that. Now, for auditing purposes, we want to be able to export our logs. We want to be able to save them. But to do that, it's another lesson in itself. We had to create a log sync. We had to basically create a bucket as well in S3, uh, actually in uh, cloud storage, that is. And then we got to ingest the logs. We could also um, use BigQuery if we want, whatever we want to ingest them with. But basically, we want to use the um, VPC logs for, for several reasons. First of all, we want to monitor what's going on. We want to look at the network, diagnose what's going on. We want to be able to look at the flows to see what traffic is going on on the network at the time or maybe times a day. Helps us understand traffic growth as well. And then also, too, can help us analyze traffic between different regions and zones as well. Also can be used for network forensics, but also to security analysis. Like uh, we could use this as part of an SIEM structure, security information and event management system. And then the logs as well, again, would be, um, as you could see, just in case you didn't notice, is part of stack driver logging. So we're actually in stack driver logging. And these flow logs are going to be connected for each VM connection at specific intervals. And with that said, it's going to store um, these logs for 30 days. So if we want to save these for more than 30 days, any of the logs um, that we um, have, we want to, of course, um, um, export them to, uh, to cloud storage or big uh, table, big query, that is. So we have some options uh, as well. With that said, that's a brief overview. Um, basically, if you want to learn more about Stackdriver, monitoring, logging, um, uh, trace, etc. That's another whole day in itself. So very powerful utility here in uh, Stackdriver. But main point here is that VPCs have flow logs. They're really important to be able to um, see what is going on. Um, and also one other thing I forgot to mention was we could use Cloud PubSub. And this could provide a streaming service for us of any kind of um, traffic or messages that might come up. So again, it's really up to um, us to um, configure these services in a manner that makes uh, sense to us. So let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about infrastructure as code, also known as Cloud Deployment Manager in Google Cloud Platform. Now. Why do we want to have infrastructure as code? We want version control. We want to deploy 
consistent configurations. We may want to have audit trails. We may want to have a pipeline. We may want to fail back. So having a way to deploy resources such as VMs or other services, we want to be able to understand, at least from a networking perspective, that we can basically roll out our configs, our networking configurations, for example, including our firewall configs and our VM networking configs for subnetting, VPCs, etc., as part of an infrastructure as code solution. Now in Google Cloud, we know that it's Deployment Manager. And again, the way this uh, works uh, has some similarities to AWS, but there's some differences. For example, with GCP, you have the ability to deploy in several different approaches that gives you more flexibility whereas AWS is strictly a stack approach. Syntax is different, templates are different. Um, I won't go into um, all the little details for this course, but one thing to, to definitely keep track of is that GCP Deployment Manager is a global solution for Google Cloud. And that is because of the networking infrastructure with software-defined networking. And of course, we know the main reasons around why customers use Google Cloud. Now, Deployment Manager is an infrastructure deployment service that is going to automate and essentially create the management of the resources for you. So basically, you're going to go ahead and create a template and declare them in a schema file. With the Cloud Marketplace, this is also a way we could deploy via Deployment Manager via what's called a Marketplace template. And essentially, what we would do is go into the Marketplace and deploy a solution. So let's go ahead and continue on. Well, welcome back. Now, let's talk about infrastructure as code and how we could deploy our resources in Google Cloud. And I'm going to talk specifically as well around networking and give you some facets of how this could be done via templates and scripts. With that said, let's continue on. Now, what we want to do first is talk about what is the Cloud Marketplace. And you can see that we're at the Cloud Marketplace. And this is similar to the AWS Marketplace, where we look for a predefined solution, deploy like a LAMP stack or something. We could go ahead and do many different things with this. We go over here, for example, let's say we want to deploy um, a operating system or use developer tools, for example. Um, I go over here and deploy WordPress. And if I launch WordPress, I could launch it on Compute Engine. And then I go over here and basically call this Cloud Networking Demo. I have the ability to, um, and this is different than AWS, we have the ability to go ahead and change our information before we deploy it, such as a machine type uh, and the amount of memory in vCPU. We also have the ability to change our disks. Also, too, with networking, we want to go ahead and select, for example, um, the network we want to deploy this on, the subnet uh, that we want to use, and then if we want to have uh, an IP or not, that's external. Now, being that this is a WordPress app, we, of course, would want to have an external IP because it is essentially what? It's a website, a blog post. What we want to do is allow web traffic. Now, do we want to allow web traffic or not? Um, that is unsecured, for example. That's up to us to decide. But we could configure, for example, our source IP ranges so that, for example, if we want to deploy this um, to a limited audience, we go ahead and put in specific IPs um, or a range for that matter and allow traffic only for HTTP traffic from a specific IP range, uh, for example. So it gives you some flexibility. Now, a couple other things to point out before we deploy this 
is um, if you look over here, this tells us our pricing that we're going to pay for, tells us the configuration and the estimated cost that it would take to deploy this in Google Cloud Platform. Now, what's really nice is most of the templates there is no cost for. There may be a licensing. You may need to have a license uh, before. For example, like with uh, certain blockchains or certain um, basically services like Jenkins, you may need to have a license. Again, it's all dependent on what you have or what you want to go ahead and subscribe to. Basically, the um, licensing model varies uh, by application uh, vendor, for example. So you'll want to check on that. Okay, and then basically here we're deploying a LAMP stack as well with WordPress. This gives us information on how we could go ahead and add plugins and add uh, extras to our deployment if we so choose. Let's go ahead and deploy this. Now, pay attention to what's going to happen now. You'd see when I deploy a marketplace solution, it brings us over to Deployment Manager, which is what? Our infrastructure as code solution in Google Cloud. Now, what is going on here is that this is deploying our templates. This is deploying our YAML file. This is what's really nice about it, is you can see it's configuring our firewall for us. It's starting the Python script, for example, here. It's going ahead and also deploying, for example, our virtual machine. And then over here, you'll see once it gets up, it'll deploy our website uh, and give us credentials to, to administer it as well. Now, the service completed, so now you can see it's fully deployed. What I want to point out is if we go over here, let's check out our app. Is it up? Yes, it is. Now, let's go back and talk about some areas that uh, are focused on networking. The first thing is, is, let's go over to our networking config and our demo software config. Let's go ahead and click on config. You can see that this has given us some information. The first thing is, is that it is telling us that the property is essentially a configuration, a hold software for the networking demo that we just deployed. Then if we go over here to software, this tells us a little bit more information and gives us properties about what has been deployed, how it's been deployed, the parent, for example. Over here is our startup script. But if we go down here to the firewall rules, we have port 80 and then port 443. Now, what's interesting enough, if you look over here, this gives us our information for the network gives us information for anything that we might have put in for ranges, gives us a protocol. But if we go to manage resource, this brings us right over to the firewall rules that we deployed. And if we want, we go in and edit these firewall rules, like, for example, put in um, course test, for example, we could turn on logs. Now, this, this is one of the things we may want to do. Let's say we want to go ahead and have um, some trace logs that are keeping track of any requests that are coming in um, through uh, this, this firewall. So it basically allows us to keep track of what is going on. And you want to do this for audit purposes in most cases. And then over here, it gives us some information on the test network. It tells us the direction of the traffic and any targets as well so let's go back and talk about the other one here which is 443 gives us a protocol as you would expect same exact thing we go into this and configure this firewall rules when we configure this firewall rule we go ahead in and modify it change the priority uh, again default priorities are pretty standard uh, as you would expect in the firewall world um, one thing to point out here is um, we go ahead and select allow all or we just select a specific protocol. In this case, we don't want to just allow any port and protocol to come in. We want to um, keep it to um, secure traffic, which is on 443. Go over here to disable rule. So, for example, if I want to disable it, I could go ahead and select that as well. What's also nice 
um, is down the bottom of the screen. We have the ability to take this information and our developers can plug this in into the API. Now let's go back to Deployment Manager. And if we go over here, this will bring us over to the instance with the virtual machine. Now we have a lot more options here as far as what we can configure, update, delete, whatever we want to do. One of the things that if we do want to connect to the virtual machine, we need to enable remote access. So if you're not familiar with remote access, again, this is very similar to a serial port access. And what it's really meant for is, of course, for troubleshooting and analysis purposes. If we scroll down here, we have the ability to um, look at our labels or keys. This is important to know just because if we're going to monitor this, we may want to, or have audit logs, we may need to add some additional labels to identify this. Now, as far as firewall rules here, we could allow traffic as well or deny it. We also have deletion protection and a lot more of options that are available, but I'm going to focus uh, mainly on the networking ones for this course. SSH. Yes, we can block a project uh, SSH keys project wide. Now, basically, if we check it, that is basically saying that these keys cannot access this instance in this project. If we had keys, we would, of course, add them and then add that to the block key list if we wanted to. Service accounts. This is, of course, important for the services to be able to be um, accessed by Compute Engine in this case. And then if we go back up, we have, of course, the ability to go back to where we were and go over here to our SSH. We can log into the admin panel. We could open this in the browser window. We could use G Cloud as well. This gives us our command could run this in Cloud Shell. Now, when we click that in Cloud Shell, what's really nice is it's going to go ahead and paste that login information for us and bring us right to where we want to go. Now, what's going on because we're using Cloud Shell, we're in the browser, it's considered a secure connection already. If I was using, for example, my SDK locally, I'd have to log in to the VPN and then of course go through a bastion host typically and again go through the process that we'd want to use. Now one of the things to point out here and I'm going to go ahead and move this up so you can see it is that uh, it is um, giving us some warnings and these warnings are just saying it's going to go ahead and deploy the key We'll have to enter a um, passphrase when it's ready. Now, this can take, of course, uh, a few minutes to propagate. Once you're propagated, you'll get um, basically some passphrase information here. Um, and then you could log in once it is ready. And now I am logged in, as you can see over here. Let me go ahead and pull it up because I know my screen's a little small. Go ahead and see this. Uh, uh, logged in now. So with that said, let's go ahead and move on. If you've been using AWS, then likely you're familiar with this free resource called cloudping.info. This is actually a cool service to measure latency from your browser to each of the Amazon regions. And if you go down here, you select HTT ping. And you can see it's going to spit out the latency. And you can see that that uh, completed OK. Now, with Google Cloud, it, it has its own little freeware version of this as well. And it's called GC ping. And basically, you go over here, measure latency to each of the regions as well. And it explains how it works. 
Now, remember, too, that uh, uh, depending on your service provider, the latency could be all over the map. I like to also use a tool called Cloud Harmony as well. That's pretty useful. But this, this works just as well. And if you go here, this will update. And um, this will measure the latency and let you know what it is. And then if you want to reload, that'll refresh as well. And you can see that this points out um, basically uh, the closest region, essentially with the best latency at the point in time, which would be Northern Virginia, which is, um, again, sort of odd. But it's not odd because the service provider I use, I know, routes um, a little bit odd. Uh, Charleston's four hours away from me, but Northern Virginia is about 10 or 11 hours. But again, it's not geographic distance. It's your service provider that you're using. And you could go ahead and validate this. So again, check it out if you're interested. It is called gcping.com. Another resource you should take a look at is quicklabs.com. I'm over here at the catalog, and you can see that it shows Cloud Environment over here. And I have Google Cloud Platform and AWS. Now, what's neat about this service is that it's a, a fairly uh, low cost. I wouldn't say it's really low cost, but it's fairly low cost and allows you to actually practice in a lab environment and be able to use the lab environment that is structured essentially so you can follow along and be able to do exercises and also get some help uh, as well. With that said, if I scroll down, you can see that there's a fair number of labs here. And this is actually mixed between GCP and AWS. What I like to do now is I'm going to go ahead and select Google Cloud Platform and then select Filter. And this will, uh, as you can see, should clear up to only the GCP labs. If you would like to go ahead and practice around Google Cloud Platform, let's say around storage or um, any other facets like networking or machine language, you know, cloud architecture, you know, if you're going to take the certification, there's what's called quests and these quests are essentially a series of labs that are, are put together to enable you to get practice in specific areas. This one here called GCP Essentials is essentially a um, a series of labs that has seven labs, 23 credits. And I'll show you here in a second how you correlate uh, the number of credits to the cost. This says it's actually intermediate. And again, if you scroll down, you can see that it's got a lot of different areas as part of it, like create a virtual machine, use Cloud Shell, provision services with Cloud Launcher, Kubernetes, and Cloud Infrastructure, and Load Balancing. If I go back, let's say I want to go look at specific areas around Cloud Architecture. Let's say I want to take the GCP Cloud Architect exam. This would probably be the closest series of labs that you would take for that. And it's pretty close to what you would take in the architect course if you took it from Google anyways. And you can see that the, the labs are fairly similar. Now, the one thing I did want to point out is this is 54 credits. If I go over here and it says buy credits, it says that I have... 1146 credits again this is a shared uh, service that I have with some other um, customers that I'm training but you could see that uh, there's uh, these are purchases that were, were made for example I could also share credits with friends but I could go over here to buy credits and they have a subscription where you could use essentially uh, all the labs for $55 a month if you want to buy eight credits, it's essentially eight dollars. Ten credits is ten, and as you see, it works out to a dollar a credit. Now, if you want to buy them in bulk, uh, you can see that you'll get a small discount. It's like ten to fifteen percent. 
uh, you know, generally you're not going to have individuals buy more than, you know, 100 credits or so typically, not even that in most cases. But if you're an organization that uh, is doing training or is just trying to get your um, cloud personnel up to, to date without having to have them use production environment, this is a good approach to, to use. With that said, let's go back here and go to, uh, let's see, credits and subscriptions. You can see that um, it says that the credits expire in so many months. That's another thing, too, to point out is that uh, the credits do expire after six months. So you need to use the credits before they expire. They don't generally like to re enable those. Matter of fact, I, I've never seen them do that, but. Again, I don't know if they will. Uh, so with that said, this is a quick lab. Let's go back to the catalog. I want to just show you one more thing. And you could see that there's, um, again, AWS. So let's filter that again. Let's just say I want to look for cloud storage. In this case, I can go ahead and type in cloud storage. You go ahead and see it'll pull up three labs. This is a good way, too, for you to just do a lab instead of a series. So let's say if I just want to do uh, cloud storage, I could go ahead and filter for that as well. It'll bring up the cloud storage labs, as you can see. And it also brings up other labs that reference cloud storage to it. But you can see the first two clearly um, have uh, cloud storage in it. The rest here are going to essentially, uh, you know, correlate something in the lab itself to cloud storage. Like, for example, setting up a file drop or, or retrieving data from cloud storage. But these two here, if you wanted to go to like the quick start, you go ahead and see that this is a cloud storage console overview. Goes through creating a bucket. If I go here, you see that it has 30 minutes. I could start the lab. If I start the lab, you have exactly 30 minutes. It will kick you out and you will not be able to proceed when you do the lab. So just be aware of that. So don't go ahead and uh, start the lab and then think you'd come back two hours later to finish it. That's probably the one thing that I personally don't like. I think they're a little bit too strict on the time, but the reality is that 30 minutes is actually more than enough to complete this lab. It, it probably will take you about 12 minutes at the most. But again, you can see it walks you through, you know, different steps that you'll do. You go ahead over here, for example, cut and paste specific commands. Shows you how to create a bucket. Tells you how to configure it so on and so on. It's a very simple lab. With that said, this is called quicklabs.com. This is the cost. If you're looking for more of a free option, there is code labs, but the uh, number of labs available around architecture is pretty limited in code labs, but feel free to take a look at that as well. So code labs is a resource that you could use that is free it has specific guided tutorials where you could go and practice specific tasks, not only in Google Cloud, but also Android and uh, other facets like uh, this one's TensorFlow. Uh, this is Android. This is actually web development, Android TV. So you can see that it's all over the map. In this case here, we really just want to focus on Google Cloud. So let's go ahead and type in Google Cloud. You can see that it brings up approximately, what, 9 or 10 plus, I guess you consider that one, 11 different uh, exercises you go through. You can see that it, this one here is build a Node.js and Angular web app with GCP, data proc, data prep, pub sub so on and so on if we go over here to the cloud storage since this is more related to data storage we'll go ahead and take a look at this specific exercise 
you can see that it tells you what you're going to need. First of all, you do need to have a GCP account. Uh, you do also um, need to have a Gmail uh, as well. Uh, again, you know, that's up to you to create. Uh, if you follow the instructions here, it tells you what you're going to do. You're going to go ahead and create uh, with the console user interface and command line, essentially uh, a couple buckets and migrate to those and create permissions as well on those buckets. And you're going to go through the UI. It walks you through step by step what to do. So I do believe this is actually pretty useful for a lot of folks um, to just follow step by step. It's sort of a, a lab that you would get similarly in some of the Google courses anyways. So you're sort of getting, uh, in some cases, exactly the same thing that Google would give you in a, you know, $3,000 course. So with that said, um, this does have value. The only thing is that you do need to have your own GCP account. Whereas like with Quick Labs, you'll get a GCP account set up for you and you just copy and paste that user and login information. So this is, uh, you know, essentially Code Labs. Play around with it, see if it's useful. It's really focused, of course, on developers, but there's definitely some useful exercises for everyone that wants to get some practice on Google Cloud. Now, one resource you really need to know about that I really like as well is the solution icons. And if we go over to cloud.google.com slash icons, it'll bring us over to the library. Now, the reason we want to get these, first of all, is because we probably want to do some kind of diagram, write a paper, put it together in, in you know, some documentation of how you're going to connect up to Google Cloud or what services in Google Cloud you're going to be using. And this is where you want to go to get the icons, the templates, etc. Now, there's an asset library on the page. Um, again, you have different examples that are provided uh, as well. Um, the first thing, again, you want to pick the format. In this case, I'm just going to use PowerPoint because that's what I generally use. And I'll go ahead and pull it up right now. And this is, again, what you would um, pull down. Uh, basically, you would have a PowerPoint file. And if you go through this, this tells you um, what is available uh, in the resource here. And they also have uh, use cases diagrammed out as well. So you can see here I have my typical icons. I have um, elements that I could add, take away. I could put together however I want. And you can see I could go ahead and change this over to something else. And again, this is free to use. It's up to you to um, just download it and make it work uh, in your case. And also, too, you can see that they have all the services iconed out. So if you want to get the icon for Container Engine, which is now actually Kubernetes Engine, you can do that, Cloud SQL. And then if we scroll over here down, um, what I'd like to do is show you this before we go, is we have essentially examples of specific architectures, like a rendering architecture. Now, this site as well, the diagrams that we download actually could be very useful for studying for any of the cloud architect exams from Google, such as the network security or the cloud architect, but also to the data engineer uh, exam and the developer. So with that said, take a look at what's available here. Uh, I think it's going to be a great resource, especially if you're just getting started in Google Cloud. So let's go ahead and move on.